Our story begins with our protagonist opening his eyes and wondering where he was. Meanwhile, in the realm of the ancient immortals, the Lord's residence's mighty powers were released outside. A man named Jan Tian shouted, May heaven bless our Lord's family and the birth of his only heir. Then the man told Tian that the madam had given birth and it was a boy. Tian excitedly ordered the man to quickly bring his grandson out for him to see. A minute later, Tian was happily carrying his grandson in his hands. Our protagonist, who reincarnated as a baby, wondered if it was another world. Tian looked at him excitedly and happily and called him son. But then two powerful lights came down in front of them and slowly turned into people. One of the old men told Tian that the madam had finally given birth after carrying for ten years. The other got his permission to hold the child. But the two men were shocked to see a dragon flame near the child's chest. They knew it was the ancient divine body and thought it was a pity. In nature, various good things are influenced by the heavens and earth. This gives rise to special body types, known as the 3000 physiques. Among these, the ancient divine body ranks in the top five. With successful training, one can fight with emperors. However, lately, the rules of heaven and earth have changed a lot. Ten chains have come down to limit the growth of the divine body. One of the men comforted Tian. He said that although it would be hard for his grandson to train, Given his family's high status in the immortal realm, it won't be hard to give the child a life like that of a normal emperor. Our protagonist was shocked and wondered if this was the start of a story for a hero who doesn't do well in a manga. Suddenly, a system message popped up. It congratulated him for getting the ancient divine body system. It asked if he would like to sign in but warned that first-time sign-ins might get a big hit and a rare five-star reward or higher. He wondered what the ancient divine body system was, but he signed in because he thought it was interesting. Then the system showed him that he had signed in successfully. So, he got an 8-star rare reward, a complete great accomplishment ancient divine body. But he wondered how he got that reward. Could it be from outside himself? Then he felt that he couldn't move his body. The two old men were shocked to see a strong light coming out of his body. This made the two men ask in a panic, what is going on? The chain that held him, unable to cultivate, burned and slowly wrapped around the other chains. Then one of the chains broke, and the other chains continuously broke, freeing him from being held. Tian was shocked, seeing him break the chains and release a powerful force that surrounded the realm. But Tian was even more stunned when he saw a lot of people in the fog bowing their heads to his son. After that, Tian loudly said it was a divine body phenomenon, the reverence of myriad saints, and that his grandson has the demeanor of a great emperor. This made him worriedly think it was something Tian shouldn't say. One of the men told Tian he couldn't believe that the grand ancient divine body naturally broke free from the chains. Another man told them that when the ancient dragon's nest produced long Aeotian, he was so pleased with himself, he was in for a surprise now. He was stunned with horror, knowing they were praising him as if he was invincible now, and wondered if he should keep a low profile in the future. Tian realized he hadn't even given his precious grandson a name yet and asked them what they thought of Everlasting. The old men replied it was too common and too cliché. Suddenly, Jiang Ru, the birth mother, asked them how about naming her child Ziyoyao, which means free and unrestrained. Then she explained that becoming immortal is easy, but being carefree is hard. She only hoped her child would lead a carefree life in the future. Tian agreed and told them they should name the child Jun Ziyoyao. One of the old men told Tian not to worry because Jun Wuhui was the white gown god king, so perhaps Wuhui hadn't fallen and might be trapped somewhere. Tian sadly looked at Ziyoyao, who was smiling cutely, and replied that he hoped so. Meanwhile, in the Jun family's ancestral cemetery, the coffin lid suddenly moved and made a loud noise. The people surrounding it were shocked and shouted that something was wrong and that the ancestor's coffin lid couldn't hold back anymore. Meanwhile, in the realm of the ancient immortals, Ziyoyao was peacefully sleeping in his mother's arms. Jan told the clan elders that once the news of Ziyoyao's attainment of the great divine holy body spread, the consequences would be significant. They needed to work together to hide the holy body fluctuations in Ziyoyao. One of the old men agreed and told them that many forces in the immortal city were targeting their Jun family. Another man said that a tree that stands out in the forest will be destroyed by the wind. This made Jan think that the old man understood well not to act badly and to be careful. Tian told Ru to come over with the child. Ru did as told while saying sorry to his father Tian and the clan elders for the trouble. Then the elders and Tian started calling the black faced Thunder Lord. Black killing heavenly soldier, the four straight driven fights, and Yang God steps and gang. A strong light then covered Ziyoyao, making him feel weightless. But then an old man yelled and asked what these foolish young people were doing. The old man used his power to stop their powers. This shocked the elders, and the mysterious old man's power also stopped their chanting and broke the realm in the process. Tian asked the old man who he was. The old man said he was the 18th generation ancestor while holding Ziyoyao in his hand. 
Hearing this, the elders and Tian knelt down and welcomed their 18th generation ancestor. But the old man angrily told them that he wondered when the Jun family started needing to hide their actions. He asked if they couldn't even protect a child. Xiaoya wondered why there was another old man and thought they all looked the same, so he couldn't remember anymore. Tian begged the old ancestor not to be mad and said they were scared that someone would hurt his grandson in the future. But the old ancestor told them to let him see who dared to do so. He ordered them to tell everyone that he didn't mind starting an immortal battle if someone harmed the child. He would turn heaven and earth upside down with his power. This made Tian and the elders silent. They knew an immortal battle was a world war started by the immortal realm's Taoist tradition. A battle that would turn heaven and earth upside down with much bloodshed. And they couldn't believe the old ancestor was actually willing to do that. Tian respectfully asked the old ancestor if he was willing to risk his life to guard that child. The old ancestor simply replied, why not? Even though he was aware that risking one's life was an extreme practice unearthed by top cultivators in the immortal world. This involves sealing oneself in a coffin, fully cut off from the outer world. You either break out from the coffin if you succeed or remain buried in it if you fail. Next, the old ancestor said that the great divine ancient holy body was a heaven-sent blessing for his Jun family's divine child. It was a big fortune, hence all Jun family assets would be diverted to that child, also granting him the zero sequence. The elders and Tian were stunned by this news. Tian didn't understand what the zero sequence meant and felt there had been too many arrangements already. He then inquired if someone could explain them. The Jun clan has a large population, totaling tens of thousands of clan members. Among them, ten special individuals can obtain a sequence bestowed by the old ancestor. Holding a sequence means you possess the eligibility to vie for the family head role. One individual surpasses these ten, known as the next generation family leader. Moreover, the last zero sequence belonged to Jun Xiaoyao's father, the white-clothed divine king, Jun Wuhui. Tian conveyed to the old ancestor that the scheme might not be fitting because each sequence holder must undergo endless trials and Xiao Xiaoyao was born with zero sequences. Thus, he pondered how Xiaoyao could earn the approval of others. The old ancestor grinned and told Tian that if people don't accept it, they're welcome to challenge Xiaoyao in the future. He didn't fret over it, leaving Xiaoyao flabbergasted. He yelled at the old ancestor that he's still merely a kid and asked if he could just lie down. However, his utterances were converted to baby language, leading the old ancestor to warmly advise him not to cry and to elevate his arms. Tian silently informed Wu Hui that his son was born. Xiaoyao, in his mind, pleaded the old ancestor to halt lifting his hands and to supply him clothes as he was chilly. Right then, a system alert appeared, stating he should proceed to the Taeyu Ancient Steel to sign in, causing him to ponder where the Taeyu Ancient Steel was. Three years later, outside the realm, a lady shouts that the divine child of the Jun family, who alarmed the 18th generation ancestor, is now three years old. She says they should contact her to buy the latest news about the divine child. On the other hand, inside, Tian tells Xiaoyao that what he is about to say next is crucial, so he should listen carefully. Then Tian tells him that cultivation starts with the physical realm, which has five major realms. With the help of heavenly treasures and earthly materials, one can achieve great success. After that comes the divine storage realm, which also has five major realms. These match the five organs of the human body, heart, liver, spleen, lungs, and kidneys. Once the divine storage reaches the fifth realm, one can gather spiritual energy, condense the divine official and transform into a true spirit. He asks his grandfather how long it takes to break through the divine storage realm. Tian replies that it takes five years for an ordinary person and three years for a genius. But for him, maybe one or two years will be enough. He asks why only one or two years when he feels like he could break through at any time. Tian tells him to show his cultivation technique, and he says all right. Then he shows his cultivation technique level to his grandfather. Tian thinks it's impressive that his grandson enters a meditative state so quickly. But then Tian is shocked to see that he directly broke through two realms in a row without any stop. Tian is even more shocked to see that he broke through all five realms. After that, he stops showing his cultivation and excitedly tells his grandfather that he thinks he has successfully broken through the divine storage realm. But he is shocked to see his grandfather lying on the ground, happy, telling him that he is impressive and his talent is extraordinary. He asks Tian if he is alright, worriedly. Tian says he is fine and just deeply moved right now. Then Tian excitedly tells him that to celebrate his breakthrough into the divine storage realms, he wants to give him a gift. He asks him what he wants, but he knows that even though his grandfather asks him what he wants, he still doesn't know that world very well. Then he remembers something and asks his grandfather if he knows what the Taeyu Ancient Steel is. Tian says that, by chance, no one knows the Taeyu Ancient Steel better than him. Then Tian tells him that it is a stone steel standing in the desolate Tangxian domain. 
As long as they attack it, it can measure their physical strength. Then later, their Jun family dug it up and placed it in the martial arena for the younger disciples to test their physical strength. He was amazed that it was quite close. Then he sweetly asked his grandfather if he could take him to see the Taeyu ancient steel. Because now that he had broken through the divine storage realm, he could also test his physical strength. Tian laughingly lifted him up while agreeing and told him that his grandfather would accompany him. He flatteringly told his grandfather that he was the best. Meanwhile, in the martial arena, someone stepped on the stage. The lady touched the stone steel, looked at it to check it, gathered her power in her hand, positioned herself while aiming her fist at the stone steel, and punched it using her Zhen Tian golden palm power. After that, she looked at her hand, waiting for the light to slowly disappear, and saw that her Jin was 150,000. The man with other people was shocked that she got 150,000 jin and asked how old she was. The lady next to him replied that she was the girl from the branch family and she seemed to be quite famous. The blue-haired lady called her Jun Linglong to tell her that she was known as the seven skillful Linglong Heart, destined to become a saint in the future. She asked her why her strength had only increased by 30,000 jin compared to the last test. This made the other trainee say in shock that 30,000 jin was already impressive. But the trainee's friend told her that the lady with blue hair was Lan Kingya, and she was the follower of the 10th ranked Jun Janjian, so they shouldn't provoke her. Kingya walked closer to Linglong while asking her why she wasn't responding. If she had nothing to say, Linglong just kept quiet and turned around to leave, making Kingya mad. Kingya shouted, telling her not to ignore her. In anger, Kingya told Linglong that she had heard she rejected the invitation from their young master Janjian. She replied that it was true and explained that since she had to choose a lord, she had to be cautious. She made clear to Kingya that Jun Janjian's strength was not bad but he lacked generosity. Then she started to leave again, asking Kingya why he would let her come and bother her if he was generous. Kingya was about to attack her while shouting that she was arrogant and that she would teach her a lesson on behalf of her master Janjian. But Linglong just grabbed Kingya's hand before she could attack, making Kingya shake in pain. Linglong seriously told Kingya that if it was just her, she'd rather not. Suddenly, someone happily said that it was it, making the two ladies surprised. She wondered when that child appeared. On the other hand, the system showed Xiaoyao that he had arrived at the check-in location, Taeyu Ancient Steel, and he checked in successfully while he was touching the steel stone. The system also congratulated him for receiving a six-star and gaining Divine Elephant imprisoning Kai. Then the system showed him that the reward was being distributed. It started with myriad forms of elephants, endless transformations. Then the giant elephant matured into a juvenile stage, transforming into a dragon elephant. Next, the dragon elephant turned into its original, primitive form. Lastly, the original, vigorous elephant's power transformed into the divine elephant, marking the ultimate completion. He figured out that it was a six-star reward, a divine elephant imprisoning Kai, and remembered that the reward he got last time was the complete primordial saintly body, which seemed to be eight stars. This made him wonder if the star level indicated the strength of the technique and what the highest number of stars could be. Suddenly, Kingya loudly asked him who he was and if he knew where that place was. She then told him it was not a place for kids. He looked back annoyed by Kingya's noisy voice and told her he was Celestial Emperor Palace's Jun Xiaoyao, and asked her if she had any objections. Linglong was shocked upon hearing this, and the people there were shocked too, wondering if he was the one who caused the 18th generation ancestor to come out of seclusion and who was granted the title of Divine Child. Kingya looked around in panic, wondering what was going on and why everyone was getting agitated. Suddenly, someone pushed Kingya's head down, and Linglong slammed her head on the ground while respectfully telling him that they were paying respects to the Divine Child, thinking that Kingya, a troublemaker, definitely did it on purpose. Then Kingya hurriedly told him that she was paying respects to the Divine Child and apologized for her earlier rudeness. She then begged him to forgive her. The people were frozen for a moment, but then immediately bowed down while shouting that they were paying respects to the Divine Child. He was stunned to see them bowing down to him and disappointedly wondered what was going on. Shouldn't someone jump out to question at that point? Then he scolded them in public to establish his authority. He decided to forget about it, thinking that he had come to the Taeyu Ancient Steel that could test physical strength. If he had come that far, it wouldn't make sense not to give it a try. He focused on his body, released his Vajra Elephant in myriad transformations, and began to transform it into a divine elephant that released a powerful red light. This left Linglong and Kingya stunned and shocked. When he was done, he opened his eyes and struck the steel stone. After that, the fog slowly faded away, the steel stone shook for a moment, and showed that he got 10,000 jinn. This left the people open-mouthed in shock. He thought it was amazing because, even without invoking inner spiritual energy, it still had that kind of power. He really got something good again. 
but then he heard someone asking if he was only three years old. Someone said that he had the best resources since birth. One of the people told everyone that his power was quite impressive and that they couldn't expect too much from a three-year-old child. But still, he did not live up to the title of divine child. He smiled, wondering if it was what they call not convinced. But he knew it had to be that way. Then he released his true cultivating power while saying it was interesting. The ground shook because of his power, making people panic. Kinya wondered what it was because she had never felt such terrifying, oppressive pressure, not even from her master Zhang Jian. Then Xiaoyao told them that since they all found it unsatisfying, he would show them his full strength. He punched the steel stone while his grandfather looked down from above, smiling proudly at him. After his fist landed on the steel stone, it cracked quickly and collapsed into pieces. He looked at it without emotion. People were open-mouthed in shock. But when the steel stone completely collapsed, he realized it was going to be a disaster and that he had messed up. He knew the stone steel was also a treasure. He wondered how he would fix the situation. Then a firelight came out of the broken steel stone and grew stronger. It showed him that it was creating an ancient extreme realm again, granting a heavenly Tao reward. The light flew toward him and entered his body. Tian smiled and said that it was the so-called ancient extreme realm. He explained that in countless past eras, no one his age had a stronger physical body. Tian proudly told him he had just broken through to the Divine Palace Realm and touched the threshold of the Spirit Sea Realm. He really didn't know where his upper limit was. Then Tian asked him what that move was just now and where he have learned it. He said, with tears, that the Taeyu Ancient Steel had shattered. But Tian told him that even if it was broken, it was no big deal. He lifted one of the huge stones and asked his grandfather how he could say that. It was one of the treasures of their Jun family and maybe it could still be used if patched up. Tian laughed hard and teasingly told him that he had such petty concerns. Tian lifted him up and told him not to worry. Their old Jun family had plenty of treasures, they wouldn't miss that one. Tian put him on his shoulder and said they should go back. He would explain the methods of the spirit sea realm. But then someone stepped in front of them. Linglong begged them to wait. Tian angrily asked her what the matter was. She felt crushed because the pressure was so intense. Still, she knelt in front of them and shouted that she, disciple Jun Linglong, wished to serve the divine child as her master. She begged them to let her become the divine child's attendant, making him confused. The people were shocked upon hearing her, and King Yu was pissed, knowing that even her young master Zhuang Jin had personally designed to recruit her. This made her wonder if Linglong was trying to trample on the face of her young master Zhuang Jian. On the other hand, Xiaoya was silent for a moment and got off his grandfather's shoulder. Then he asked Linglong why, which made her confused. Then he asked her why she wanted to become his attendant. Just now, when she knelt down, although the sound wasn't loud, he could still hear the surrounding gasps. They whispered that she was the pride of the heavens, saying she was born with an exceptional mind and senses. So if one possesses such exceptional talents and does not meet an untimely end, they will certainly become a sage. And if she is destined to accomplish great things, why does she need to follow him? But she just asked him back if he truly did not know or if he was testing her sincerity. But he was 100% and truly confused. Then his grandfather told him that Linglong is from a branch family, and as a member of the branch family, she has pitifully few resources and connections. So if she wants to rise, she must establish a relationship with the main family. Then Tian proudly told him that the little girl has good judgment because she recognized at a glance that his grandson is destined for great things. This made him realize that it was because of the family hierarchy, and he was fortunate to have been born well. Then he told her that he knew now the reasons she wished to follow him and that he can agree. However, she'll have to serve him tea, pour water, wash clothes, fold blankets, and keep him company when he was bored. This made her frustratingly confused. But when he told her that if she can do that, he'll provide her with all the resources she wants, she was happy to hear it. She swore to him that she, Linglong, was willing to follow the divine child through thick and thin, even unto death. He replied, all right, and jumped onto her shoulder while happily shouting that they should return to the celestial emperor's palace. This made her so confused. But then his grandfather asked him if being lifted up by his grandfather wasn't special, and he replied, no, then told his grandfather to stop joking. Compared to a muscular old grandfather, a young lady is definitely better. This made his grandfather shocked and tearfully asked him what did he say. Linglong asked him if it was really okay, and he told her not to worry and that they should go. While his grandfather was sulking on the ground, Linglong just wondered if she wouldn't be kicked out of the Jun family tomorrow morning for stepping in with her left foot first. On the other hand, someone was running fast. While running, Kinga thought she must notify her young master Zhuangjian as soon as possible. Then she jumped into the center of the forest and caught her breath in relief, knowing that she arrived at their master Zhuangjian's realm. She was afraid that she'd drunk her saliva and was about to start walking when a sword attacked her. Someone told her to stop. The men in the tree branch told her that she should know that their young master was in seclusion, so she shouldn't disturb him. But she shouted at them that something big had happened. 
the kid called Jun Ziaoya broke through the ancient extreme realm, and even Jun Linglong chose to follow him. So if they don't notify their young master soon. But the man with the scar told her that they should let their young master decide on such matters after he comes out of seclusion. And the other man said that he bet Kingya probably had nothing better to do than provoke Linglong and get slapped in the face. So now she is running to their young master to complain. She was pissed upon hearing the man. Then she shouted at him to watch his mouth if he was not looking for a fight. But suddenly, they felt the forest shake, and they were shocked to feel a strong aura. Then someone flew up from underground. The man smiled and powerfully looked at them. Kingya happily shouted that it was their young master Zhuangjian, and he had come out of seclusion. Then she happily hugged her young master and told him that he had finally come out of seclusion. He asked her if she had come specially to welcome him out of seclusion. But Kingya complained to him that those two guys earlier had stopped her from seeing him. She asked if he thought they were awful. He replied that they were indeed awful and ordered the two men to slap themselves 20 times, to which they immediately obeyed. Then he sweetly asked her who else had upset her because she looked so aggrieved. She tearfully replied that it was all because of Linglong. Then she told him that he might not know, but Linglong had started following a very arrogant brat. That brat's name seemed to be Jun Ziaoyao, and it was like Ziaoyao was tarnishing his reputation. But he just silently looked at her and attacked her, which made a loud explosion. The two men who were slapping themselves were shocked. A few seconds later, he asked her if she hadn't gone around shouting his name in front of Ziaoyao. He told her that she had really been spoiled, but she was just silently shocked and confused. Zhuang Yin knows that Ziaoyao is the son of the Wuhui clan uncle and the Jiang family's goddess, also quite favored by the 18th generation ancestor. So if they offend him, they might lose their 10th sequence position. Zhuang Yin knows they have to go apologize. Meanwhile, in the Celestial Emperor's place, Tian was angrily looking at Ziaoyao who was trying to avoid his grandfather's gaze. Tian sulkily told him that their Ziaoyao, at a young age, turns out to be quite the charmer and that now he has got a young lady. He doesn't need his grandfather anymore. He sweetly asked his grandfather how it could be and that he'll always be his grandfather's dearest little treasure. Tian pushed him away while telling him to stop being canny there and reminding him that he was asking him what's the technique he used today by the Taeyu ancient monument. He hesitantly replied that, by a bit of a marvelous chance, it was called Divine Elephant Imprisoning Kai, but his grandfather told him that he had never heard of it. So he explained that it was a very powerful technique and it said that when mastered, he can transform into an ancient divine elephant, even summon the gates of hell, and command the demons of hell to fight for him. Tian was shocked that it was that powerful and asked him if isn't there a risk of demonic possession. But he replied that there shouldn't be. Chan told him that in any case, it was good that he was putting in the effort and when he turned 10, they will hold a grand feast for him because, at that time, the many powers, ancient families, and supreme clans of the wild heavenly immortal realm will all attend. When that day comes, they will publicly reveal his zero sequence identity to the entire immortal realm. That will mark the beginning of his era, making him gulp in shock and fear. Then the system popped up, congratulating him for a new check in location triggered and told him to check in at the 10th birthday feast, making him confused and wonder if it means he has to wait for 7 years, if isn't that time frame a bit too long, and what exactly is the pattern of those check-ins. Suddenly, Linglong appeared behind him and told him that Jun Zhuangjian from the Heavenly Emperor's Palace requested an audience outside. He shoutedly asked her how she could just appear out of nowhere and that she scared him, but she reminded him that he said she can treat that place like her own home and be at ease, making him tell her that she sure is making herself at home. But he told her to never mind it and asked who did she say wants to see him and who is Jun Zhuangjian. She replied that Zhuangjian was the young master that Lan Kingya follows and he is of the same clan as him, considering him his clan brother, but he just asked her who is Lan Kingya again. She replied that it was the little girl with the incredibly noisy voice, making him remember Kingya and told Linglong that when she said incredibly noisy voice, he knew who it was. Then he asked her what that clan brother suddenly wants from him, and she replied that his subordinate dares not make any assumption, to which he replied alright and ordered her to take him to meet that clan brother. But a minute later, he was shocked in horror when he saw someone tied to the vine torn. Zhuangjin told him that he heard that one of his followers had been acting disrespectfully and offended a brother of his, so today, he specially brought her to apologize with a token of humility. He hoped that he, his esteemed clan brother, can be generous and forgive that young girl, making him pissed, wondering what Zhuangjin means by apologizing with a token of humility, and knowing that Zhuangjian, the jerk, is clearly there to show off his authority at his expense. A minute later, Zhuangjian was seated inside. He told him that his clan brother's arrival was sudden. He could only offer simple tea and hoped he would forgive him. Zhuangjian replied it was no problem. He was the one who was abrupt. But in truth, Zhuangjian was angry. He saw that Linglong was used as a servant to pour tea and called a mischievous child. 
He looked at his cup of tea and asked Zhuangjin if he planned to have Kingya keep kneeling there. Zhuangjin replied that if he forgave her, then there was no need to make her feel bad by kneeling. He slammed his cup of tea back into its pot. He told Zhuangjin he might be misunderstanding. He never holds grudges for long. If someone offends him, he strikes back right away. So, he didn't need to please him with fake apologies. This made Linglong laugh, though she tried not to. She cleared her throat and excused herself. She told them to go on talking. This made Zhuangjin angry. He told him it seemed his clan brother was not happy with his apology. So, there was no need to keep Kingya around. Then he attacked Kingya from behind with his blade. This made a loud noise and destroyed the realm. Luckily, Linglong grabbed Kingya in time. She said it was all very crude. She asked Kingya if this was the Jun Zhuangjin she had been so worried about. Kingya stayed quiet, but Zhuangjin heard it and got angry. Xiaoyao told Zhuangjin he was acting too fast, right in the Heavenly Emperor's palace. He asked if Zhuangjin was trying to provoke him. Zhuangjin was scared and said it was a misunderstanding. He was the divine child of the Jun family, so why would he dare to offend him? Xiaoyao asked Zhuangjin if he really meant it. Then he turned the table upside down and told Zhuangjin he somehow didn't quite believe him. Zhuangjin was shocked by his action, but he was mad that Zhuangjin had come into his territory to discipline his subordinates. He even wanted to kill someone in front of him, making him wonder who he was trying to scare. Because he knew that if he were really just a three-year-old, he might have been scared. Sadly for Zhuangjin, he had messed with the wrong person. Zhuangjin was thrown due to his attack and was shocked, wondering if it was the strength of a three-year-old. He got down on the floor and asked Zhuangjin to confirm that he hadn't lied to him. Because if need be, he could fight back on his own and didn't need someone else to do it for him. Then he jokingly told Zhuangjin that the weather was good today, so they should have a little spar to grow their brotherly bond and asked if he was going to back out. Zhuangjin was mad hearing this and thought it was going too far, but he told himself to calm down and not let a three-year-old provoke him. So he told him that since his clan brother wanted to spar, he would do it. But he was older than him, so he'd only use 30% of his strength. If he could beat him, he'd give him that Yuan Tian supreme command. But if he couldn't win, he should say sorry for his proud behavior. He was confused about what Yuan Tian supreme command was. But then he heard Linglong telling him in his mind that it was good stuff. Since Zhuangjin had offered it himself, he shouldn't be shy and should beat Zhuangjin up to get the token. Because that token might be tied to a legendary supreme secret treasure. He asked her to tell him more, and she explained that the term supreme refers to those who stand at the top of the ancient immortal realm, eternal and unbreakable. Then she told him to think about how many good things would be in a secret treasure left by such a strong being. He smiled and said that was how it was. He then creepily told Zhuangjin that he was very generous and thanked him for it, making Zhuangjin shocked and shaky, thinking that the divine child of the Jun family might just be a money grubber after all. A few minutes later, Zhuangjin wondered what was going on and what exactly happened. He knew that he was the highly esteemed 10th sequence of the Jun family, a universally recognized genius which made him wonder why he was being suppressed by a three years old and thought that there was Xiaoyao twisting and turning is so disgusting. Xiaoyao excitedly told Zhuangjin to hang in there making Zhuangjin pissed that he really want to beat Xiaoyao up black and blue. Then people appeared in their surroundings to check what was going on and saw that the 10th sequence Jun Zhuangjin and the divine child Xiaoyao had a spar. One of the men shouted that the divine child was just three years old and it was bullying. But the other man told him that it was hard to say because up until now, Zhuangjin has been the one being suppressed. Zhuangjin relaxed his body thinking that he can't let Xiaoyao lead him by the nose. Then he released his power thinking that since Xiaoyao was designed as the divine child by their 18th great ancestor, Xiaoyao naturally had exceptional abilities, so he figured out that he had been too arrogant and should take that more seriously. The people around them were shocked to see that Zhuangjin activated the Purple Emperor Sword technique making them ask if Zhuangjin really needed to use it against a three-year-old and think Zhuangjin really couldn't take a loss. Hearing them, Zhuangjin was pissed and told them in his mind that they have no idea how weird that kid was while he was telling Xiaoyao to be careful not to get hurt. Then he jumped towards Xiaoyao to attack him with his sword. Linglong who was watching them knows that the Purple Emperor's sword technique is considered an advanced technique even within the main lineage of the Jun family. Nine sword auras intertwine into a net, blocking off all escape routes for the opponent making her think that Zhuangjian is aiming to finish that spar off seriously, but she thinks it doesn't really matter. Xiaoyao lifted his hand forward to meet Zhuangjian's attack, then he simply tapped Zhuangjian's hand which made Zhuangjian ungrab his sword making him panic and look at it in horror. Then he told Zhuangjian that he always felt that his clan brother was weaker than he had imagined. Then he kicked Zhuangjian's face which made a loud explosion and teeth flying into mid-air. Zhuangjian looked at his flying teeth, wondering 
wondering if it was his tooth and why his tooth was flying in the sky. Then he collapsed, wondering what had happened. Xiaoyao grabbed the supreme token and told Zhuangjian that he would take it. Suddenly, the system showed that it had detected the key item and that he had a new check-in location. It then told him to check in at the Yuantian Supreme Secret Cache, making him say that it was really an unexpected delight. On the other hand, Linglong told Kingya that the man on the ground was Jun Zhuangjian, the one she always talked about. Neither Zhuangjian's skills nor his character were impressive, but she was never that smart to begin with. She reminded her not to be fooled by people like him. Kingya snatched back her hand while shouting that it was enough and that she didn't need her pity. Then Kingya turned around to leave. She said Jun Zhuangjian, Yung Linglong, and Jun Xiaoyao's names, but before she left, she tearfully shouted to them that she would make all of them with the surname Jun pay the price. Linglong frowned in confusion. He told her that she sure knew how to talk, no wonder people disliked her. She asked him if she wasn't just telling the truth, but he just frustratedly told her that if she got beaten up outside someday, she shouldn't come looking for him because he didn't want to deal with it. This made her more confused. Summer passed by in that noisy and bustling manner, autumn leaves fell, winter awakened, and spring blossoms bloomed. Unbeknownst to them, time had cycled through another four seasons. Seven years later, a little girl happily shouted that she had finally arrived. People in the street were happily walking and chatting. The little girl and her sister excitedly asked if it was the Jun clan's divine island because it was so lively and it would be nice to meet some cute little ones. On the other hand, inside the realm, the speaker announced to everyone that Daoji Tianzong was there. He presented nine volumes of Taoist scriptures as a gift for the divine child. Day in Holy Land was there too, offering a bottle of spirit jade marrow and a hundred pieces of top quality divine origin for the divine child. The princess of the great merchant dynasty was there as well, offering a precious treasure, a map of mystic mountains and rivers. Meanwhile, two men were walking up the stairs, each holding something in their hand. One of the men told his friend to be careful. They were carrying the formal attire for the divine child's 10th birthday banquet, and should not ruin it. His friend happily said that many noble families and clans were there to celebrate the divine child's 10th birthday, it was a grand occasion. When asked why he was happy, as they were not there for him, his friend replied that he was just sharing in the glory. He added that their divine child had been extraordinarily talented from a young age. With that retreat, he might even break through to the true spirit realm. A moment later, the two men arrived at their destination. One of them respectfully welcomed the divine child as he emerged from seclusion. He told Xiaoyao to bathe and change into his attire for the 10th birthday banquet. But when Xiaoyao did not answer, the man opened his eyes in confusion. He was shocked to see the floor slashed, and on the wall was written that he was bored and had gone out to play. This made them panic and shout that the divine child had broken out of seclusion. On the other hand, on the roof of the house, Xiaoyao was busy eating apples. He said that for a full three years, he had been consuming fasting pills. Angrily, he asked what the point of cultivation was if he couldn't even eat. Tearfully, he shouted that if they ever made him go back into seclusion, he would disown the Jun family name. Linglong was behind him, thinking that his most hated food was fasting pills. She told him that if she had to choose, not being able to bathe for 10 days to half a month during seclusion would be even more annoying to her. This made him shout exactly and ask her what she was doing there. She replied that she was there on the orders of the family head to bring back a certain divine child who had broken out of his seclusion unannounced. He gave her a fake smile, looked back, and quickly jumped away while shouting goodbye. She followed him, saying that it takes half a day to put on that ceremonial robe. If he didn't go back now, he'd be too late. But he kept running away, telling her to forget formality. He was not wearing that heavy, cumbersome ceremonial robe and would make it back when he was supposed to. So, she should chill out. Suddenly, he heard someone shouting for help. Confused, he stopped on the roof of one of the houses and saw people gathering around. The little girl angrily asks the man why he is screaming and calls him an ugly monster. Then she shouts at the man that he was the one who hurt little Gray's tiny foot first while showing her bird. The man replies that he has already apologized, but the little girl angrily asks him what good does apologizing do when her little Gray's talon is fractured. The other man panicky tells the little girl to calm down and asks if they can't work that out amicably and what kind of compensation she needs to let his young fellow off the hook. But the little girl gets angrier and asks the man who cares about his compensation and what if he takes her for a low-life scammer. Then she angrily shouts that the man broke her little Gray's leg, so she'll break one of his legs to make it fair. This makes the man fearfully ask her to spare him. Xiaoyao, who is looking from above, wonders where that unruly brat comes from and how dare she bully people on his Jun family's territory. He knows that judging by the aura, that little girl is also a cultivator. While he tosses his hidden weapon, a leftover fruit core, 
he throws it toward her thinking he should teach her a lesson. But before it hits her, she feels it coming and quickly turns around to catch it while asking who dares to sneak attack her. Then she feels something weird on her hand and quickly throws it away in panic, shouting that it's all wet and disgusting. He laughs loudly and tells her that it serves her right and it's what she gets for bullying ordinary people. She furiously looks at him and angrily asks him where that ugly monster popped up from, how dare he meddle in her affairs, and if he knows who she is. But he just tells her that whoever calls another an ugly monster is the actual ugly monster, so she is the real ugly monster there. This makes her furious and she shouts that she is infuriated. Then she jumps toward him and launches an attack behind him. He thinks she is quite fast, but he easily dodges her while teasingly telling her that she missed. Then he jumps backward to make a distance between them, knowing that it was not a force meant to harm. So he figures out that she doesn't really want to hurt him and maybe she just wants to vent. She angrily tells him to stop running and come fight her for 300 rounds. She calls him a rat and an ugly monster, but he just teasingly laughs and tells her that if she can't even catch him, what's the point of fighting? If she is so capable, she should come catch him. Then he calls her a little ugly monster. She angrily chases after him while telling him that she'll kill him. But he just runs while laughing, planning to just lead her away because he doesn't want to escalate the situation. Meanwhile, Linglong stands on some roof and looks silently at them. She knows the emblem on that little girl's cloth is from the Jiang family of Kingju. She also knows there is a young lady of the Jiang family at that little girl's age. This makes her wonder if the little girl is that young lady because, if so, it would be troublesome. Linglong chooses to watch the drama unfold, thinking it seems like it will be interesting. On the other hand, Xiaoyao and the little girl arrived at the river. When he realized it, he stopped running. The little girl shouted at him to stop right there. This made him see that she could actually keep up with him, meaning she was no ordinary little girl. She was tired and sweating but still told him that until she gave him a good beating today. He shouldn't think she, Zhang Luali, would let it go. He sighed, thinking he had just wanted to help someone out. He didn't expect it would lead to such big trouble. He wondered how he should wrap it up. Just then, a firework appeared in the sky. It got their attention, and he realized his 10th birthday feast was about to start. So he said sorry to Liuali because he was pressed for time and couldn't play with her anymore. She was confused, but he lifted his hand, gathered some power in it, and made a bright light in front of her. This made her not notice that he was running away. A moment later, nightfall arrived at Sky Emperor Palace. Then the host announced that the Jiang family from Kingju had arrived. They offered one ancient sacred weapon, three undying elixirs, 100 top-grade sacred pills, and a thousand pieces of premium divine essence. This made the nobles shocked because of the generous gifts. They said that, after all, the Jiang family had been connected with the Jun family for generations. The Jiang family could be considered the maternal side of the Jun family's divine child. Then someone entered the room. This made the nobles think that the beautiful lady in white must be Jiang Shengyi, the divine maiden of the Jiang family with a predestined Taoist constitution. The little girl beside her must be the jewel of the Jiang family, Jiang Liuali, who has a spiritual Taoist constitution. One of the nobles noticed that Liuali seemed not very happy. A man replied that it said Liuali is betrothed to the divine child of the Jun family. Kids will be kids, so they must feel awkward. Young people nowadays all talk about romantic freedom. Shengyi asked Liuali if she had hit a snag and told her they should see if she dared to run around next time. But Liuali angrily replied that if she caught that ugly creature again, she'd give him the thrashing of a lifetime. Before, her sister found him hanging from a tree. Her gray bird asked her if she was sure she could beat him. Her sister reminded her that if it weren't for that young hero with good intentions, she might not have made it to the Jun family's divine child's 10th birthday party in one piece. She said it was annoying and asked her sister why she was against her. Then someone happily called Liuali and said it had been a long time since they last saw each other. They asked how she had been recently. Liuali apologized to the little man and asked who he was. The little man panicked and asked if she had forgotten. He reminded her about the Loyu secret realm. She said she remembered now. The little man respectfully and proudly said he was Yi Zingyun from the ancient Yi family. But Liuali just walked past him, saying hello and goodbye at the same time. Shengyi whispered to Liuali that she was being rude. Liuali said she couldn't help it and told her sister that she had face blindness, so she couldn't remember such common faces. An old man with Zingyun asked if he was alright. Zingyun shyly said he thought being ignored by Liuali was awesome. The old man sighed with relief and said as long as he was happy. A moment later, when everyone was settled, Tian walked toward the stage. He noticed that almost everyone had arrived. He thanked everyone who had traveled far to attend his grandson's 10th birthday feast. As Tian walked to the stage, he heard people say they'd heard that the Jun family's divine child defeated the 10th sequence at the age of 3. They wondered what Xiaoyao's level was now and guessed he had probably reached the true spirit realm. Tian smiled proudly and saw that quite a few eager young people had come. 
he saw the 10th sequence, Jun Zhuangjian, 7th sequence, Jun Zhuang, 5th sequence, Jun Wanji, ancient Yi family, Yi Xingyun who wanted to sit next to Luali, and King Zhua Jiang family, Jiang Shengyi and Jiang Luali. The crowd happily chatted, wondering where the Jun family's divine child was and why he hadn't shown up yet. Tian smiled nervously because he didn't know what to say. He also didn't know where his grandson had run off to. He thought he'd have to stall a bit longer. Then a bright light appeared behind him, and Siyoyao laughingly called his grandfather old man and told him not to worry. The people were shocked to see him and asked if the main character always showed up last. Tian looked back in surprise and saw his grandson sitting on a broken table. He introduced himself as Jun Xiaoyao and thanked everyone for coming to his 10th birthday party. Tian whispered but angrily told him that he was late on such an important day. He asked him what he was thinking, making him realize that his grandfather was really mad this time, so he'd have to make it right with him later. On the other hand, Luoli saw him and knew that his hairstyle and clothes were the same as the guy from before. She angrily called him, making him wonder why that kid was there too. He thought he'd better think fast to get out of it. Then, he called her a beautiful young lady and asked her if they had met before. She looked closer in silence. She saw him looking good even though he was sweating a lot. But she thought that, up close, the guy was not nice to look at. So, how could he have such a cute face? She thought she must have mistaken him for someone else. This made Luoli wonder if Xiaoyao could also be an expert. Shengyi noticed that Luoli's old habits were showing again. She always acts like this when she sees something she finds cute. Suddenly Tian thought something was going on. Then he slapped Xiaoyao's back and whispered to him that he wasn't bad. This made him shocked and he asked what. But Tian just said that even though they had met already, he still had to introduce them properly. Then Tian told him that Luali is the gem of the Jiang family and she is also his fiancé. Despite her small size, she is a bit older than him. He smiled, confused. Luali was shocked and a bit confused too. But Xingyun was the most shocked and yelled out loud, asking what was going on. He was in a panic, wondering why things had turned out this way. Even as a divine child, he couldn't avoid an arranged marriage. But then he thought if he could make that young lady not like him, it wouldn't happen. So, he planned to tell her that he was the one messing with her that afternoon. When he was about to say it, she grabbed something inside her clothes and put something round and shiny in his hand. He asked her what it was, and she sweetly replied that it was an elixir made from the water of the Fountain of Youth. She told him to eat it quickly and promised her to keep that face and not grow up. Otherwise, he wouldn't be cute anymore. He knew it wouldn't work because Luali was also quite sick. But then he calmed down and told himself to keep thinking. Then he figured out something and thought there must be a way to get out of that engagement. He looked at the people behind him and thought the answer was Linglong. Then he pointed at Linglong and signaled that she better step forward quickly. He said they had already promised themselves to each other and told her to name her price. Linglong was in big shock and thought he was a stingy divine child. She signaled that she refused because she still wanted to leave alive. But he reminded her that she was his attendant, so it was her sworn duty to follow his orders. She chose to resign and apologize to him, making him mad. He knew she just wanted to watch the show and told her to tone down her smile. The people gathered around them and said a smart man and a pretty woman were truly wonderful, and they were a match made in heaven. He smiled but wondered if any of those people thought that he was still just a 10-year-old child. He hoped that someone would break that progression. Then someone slammed a hand hard on the table. Xingyun shouted that he did not agree with the marriage, making him so happy that he had tears in his eyes. The old man with Xingyun told him not to mess around, but he made clear that he wasn't messing around. Tian yelled that it was foolish and asked when it would be their Yi family's turn to meddle in the Jun family's marriage. But Xiaoyao stopped his grandfather and walked closer to Xingyun. He then made a respectful gesture and politely asked Xingyun for his name. Xingyun said his surname was Yi and his name was Xingyun. Xiaoyao smiled and told Xingyun that, since ancient times, for something like wife kidnapping, one had to show strength. Xingyun was shocked and asked him if the Jun family's divine son wanted to compete with him. Xiaoyao smiled and nodded in agreement. A moment later, outside the palace, the nobles couldn't believe that the Jun family's divine son and the Yi family's young master were about to fight. They thought there would be a good show to watch. On the other hand, someone told Zhu Wang that he heard she had come out of hiding just to attend Xiaoyao's 10th birthday. She replied that after all, that clan brother had defeated him at the age of three, so she was a little curious. This made Zhuang Jin mad, but he knew that compared to Zhu Wang, what was even stranger was that person. He looked at Wang Ji and thought it was odd that Wang Ji would come to such a banquet too. A minute later, in the courtyard outside the ballroom, 
The old man who was Xingyun's uncle and named Fu told them to be sure to stop in time. Xingyun assured Fu not to worry because he had a sense of proportion. He then launched towards Xiaoyao using his star finger attack while asking Xiaoyao for his advice. The people say that the star body of the Yi family really lives up to its reputation. They don't know how the Jun family's divine son will deal with him. But Xiaoyao just lifts his hand and taps Xingyun's hand away. Xingyun launches an attack from his left hand. Luckily, Xiaoyao avoids it. Still, Xingyun tries to attack him over and over again. Xiaoyao keeps avoiding the attacks, looking scared. After the attacks, Xingyun stops and Xiaoyao tries to balance himself. Xingyun can't believe that Xiaoyao is dodging everything. To an outsider, it looks like Xiaoyao is barely holding back Xingyun's attacks. But the truth is, Xingyun can't actually touch him at all. Xingyun looks at Liuali, who is watching from the side and saying that it's amazing. Xingyun grits his teeth in anger. He thinks he must not lose in front of Liuali. Then he activates his power and shows his star's real body skill to everyone. This makes Xiaoyao think that it looks a bit bad. Then Xingyun gathers his star cloning power in his hands. He shouts at Xiaoyao to show him how he will dodge this time making Xiaoyao shout that he is done. Then Xingyun attacked him, making him shout wow in shock. But he knew that if it kept going like this, he might be torn to pieces by that moves. So he activated his power and attacked back using his elephant subjugation fist. Shengyi shouted that it was a golden aura, the ancient sacred body. People were shocked, thinking it was no wonder Xiaoyao had sparked a vision of the All Saints cult 10 years ago. But one of them asked if there weren't rumors that the ancient body had become a useless body. The man replied that he was afraid the Jun family spent a lot of resources to help Xiaoyao break some shackles. Even so, the road of the ancient sacred body is not long. Xingyun and his power met in the center, but he got thrown in mid-air. This made Xingyun confused and Tian shocked in fear. He fell hard on the ground, making everyone there freeze. But Linglong frowned in confusion while he was coughing out blood. Fu shouted in panic and immediately rushed towards Xiaoyao, asking Xingyun how he could do it to a 10-year-old. He replied that he didn't, because at that time, Xiaoyao winked at him which made him confused. Then Xiaoyao slowly took his power back and purposely threw himself away, making Xingyun realize that he did it on purpose. He coughingly grabbed Fu's clothes and told Fu not to be hard on Xingyun. After all, it was the competition that he suggested and Xingyun's cultivation is unparalleled. So he was defeated and, as they all know, the ancient sacred body is indeed a useless body. His skills are not good and he didn't want to ruin Liuali's future. It was best to end the engagement between them. This made his grandfather mad and he told him to wait. Liuali was mad too, knowing that he was just trying to get rid of her. Then Liuali called him brother and told him to rest assured. Even if he was a useless body, she would never leave him. This made him shocked and he told Liuali that she was older than him, so she should not call him brother or come close to him. On the other hand, someone broke his cup of tea. Wanji said it was nonsense, but as you'd expect from a direct descendant born with a golden spoon in his mouth. Chu Angjian told Wanji that they were all direct descendants born with a golden spoon in their mouths. They didn't know how long they had to work hard to get something, but those people were born with it. Suddenly, someone shouted, asking what the hell it was and if it was the ancient sacred body. This made people in the palace look at the huge shining gold light at the top of the palace. The man with horn and two beasts beside him was mad, saying he couldn't even defeat a little firefly. So why did he deserve to be called the sacred body of the human race? This made him confused, but Tian knew those people were the dragon clan. Then the man called Lan Kingya who was with them, and kicked her. He asked her if she was kidding him. The man was mad and told Kingya that he had come there, especially after hearing her say there was an ancient sacred body that had broken his shackles. A few months ago, in an ancient dragon sanctuary, the people cheered their drinks and congratulated their Prince Long for successfully fusing with the dragon essence. They proudly shouted that if the dragon essence were an ordinary person, their body would have burst by now. So only someone as extraordinary as their Prince Long could refine it. The ancient dragon prince, Long Hyashin, asked them what is one dragon essence when his elder brother has already fused and refined three. He shouted that sooner or later, he'll be just like his elder brother, making his people wish him to achieve great things soon. The ogre asked the chicken man what dragon essence is, and the chicken replied that dragon essence is the flesh and blood left behind by a fallen supreme dragon. Inside it are various talents, divine abilities, and rune imprints, so it is a special treasure in the world. The ogre happily said that it was so cool and asked if they could use it too. But the chicken man replied no because a single drop would make them burst and die. Then a lady said that being happy with just merging a single dragon essence is silly when you consider that the neighboring Jun family has made a divine child that has been worshipped by 10,000 saints. One of the men angrily asked who was talking so boldly. A minute later, King Yu was thrown hard on the ground. A lady asked her who dares to be so proud and how can a mere human come to the ancient dragon sanctuary? and act so wild. 
The man who captured Kinga asked Long if they should cook her for their friends to enjoy with their drinks. But Long said no and asked Kinga what she had just said about the Jun family. Kinga lifted her head, knowing that the ancient dragon sanctuary has a problem with the Jun family, so she thought coming there was the right choice. Then she told Long that Xiaoya was sending out sword-given invites to all the big families in the vast sky realms for his 10th birthday party. She told everything to Long. But Long's people laughed hard and said that it might have been a treasure a few thousand years ago, but now it's a useless thing. They asked how Xiaoya dares to invite the big families from all around with just it. But Long told his people to be quiet and asked Kingya how such a useless thing could get the Jun family's focus. She said that the ancient sacred body is seen as a useless thing because it's held back by the heavenly Tao. Then she asked him what if Xiaoya breaks those shackles. Back to the palace, Kingya held her injured chest and called Long a wretched dragon brat while falling. Fortunately, someone appeared behind her. Linglong caught her before she fell. When they safely landed on the ground, Xiaoya called Long a young man. He told him that he had brazenly beaten up a Jun family disciple on Jun family's territory. He asked if that wasn't going too far. But Long just teasingly asked him what he was talking about. He told him that Kingya was his female slave. So, naturally, he would treat her however he saw fit. This made Kingya pissed, but she told everyone that she was the young dragon master's female slave. This made Linglong look at her in shock. Someone broke a glass cup and Zhuangjian was shocked. He wondered how dare Kingya bring someone from the ancient dragon sanctuary to disrupt the grand banquet of the Jun family. He knew it was a slap in the face to the Jun family. Also, he knew that if it was investigated, even his status wouldn't be spared. Xiaoyao asked if she was really a female slave. It was strange that a fine young lady chose not to be one. Instead, she became the slave of a young dragon person but he happily said that he got it. She must be one of those people obsessed with good fortune. This made Linglong and Kingya look at him in a daze and confused. Then he cleared his throat and ordered Linglong to take Kingya away first. She obeyed while he was embarrassed because it became awkward. Then he told everyone that his grandfather always said that their relationship with the dragon clan had never been good, especially after his father, Jun Wuhui, skinned and deboned a dragon sovereign. So, the dragon clan considered their Jun family to be mortal enemies. Then he uninterestedly told Long that if he wished to retaliate, he should come at him directly. Targeting women that way to humiliate the Jun family was despicable. Not only did it lack dignity, but it also made him look like trash. This made Long glare at him in anger, but he just continued to tell Long that it was no wonder he had been looked down upon all those years. Two of Long's people immediately launches toward him to attack him. They asked how dare he insult the young dragon master, but he didn't move away. He simply told them that the insolent ones were their lot. Then someone punched the enemy man in the face and attacked the lady dragon with sharp ice. The two enemies were thrown back to Long's side. The people who attacked the enemies were Zhuangjian and Zhu Wang. He told Long that it was the Jun family and they did not tolerate uncouth behavior from their county bumpkins there. When the two beasts jumped to attack Xiaoyao, Zhuangjian immediately jumped forward. Knowing that Kingya was invited by him to the Jun family, he must find a way to handle the matter. Otherwise, he'll be the one who will be punished. Then he used his Rising Sun 9 sword, 10,000 swords origin slash to attack one of the enemies. On the other side, Zhu Wang activated her Ice Heaven Snow Lotus and ordered it to devour the other enemy. As the story goes on, the two enemies are thrown back to their young master Long's side. Then Zhu Wang says that her Jun family is not something any Tom, Dick, or Harry can challenge. The people were shocked to see the 10th and 7th sequence members of the Jun family. The two attendants behind the dragon prince from the ancient dragon sanctuary are also descendants of ancient royal families, yet they were so easily defeated before the Jun family rankings. The other fearfully, but proudly, says that with such formidable strength and still not even in the top five, they wonder what monsters occupy the top five of the Jun family ranking. Wong looked at his collapsed and injured people and furiously glared at them. Then he told them not to be too arrogant and attacked Zhuangjian, who was in shock and got hit by his attack. Zhuangjian knows that it is the dragon clan's great divine power, intercepting the dragon's hand. But then Long angrily asks them how dare they belittle him. Then he attacks Zhuangjian while shouting for him to die. But fortunately, Zhu Wang points her sharp ice behind Long and told him not to be reckless. Long just angrily looked back and asked her how dare she interfere. Then he appear in front of her to attack. But Xiaoyao appeared forward and caught Long's attack for Zhu Wang. Long was shocked and confused to see that Xiaoyao simply just held his hand. Zhu Wang was shocked to see the divine child in front of her too. He uninterestedly looked at Long and easily squeezed Long's hand, making the bracelet break in the process. Long grits his teeth in pain, but before he can react, Xiaoyao launches an attack and punched his face. Long was pushed back because of it, but managed to compose his balance. Long's mouth bled, but then smiled and asked if it was it. 
then laughingly asked if it was the ancient sacred body that had broken its shackles. Xiaoyao told his clan brother and sister to step back because that young lizard was there for him. They both tried to reason, but Tian shoutingly told them that there were no buts. When Xiaoyao said to step back, they should step back. Then Tian happily says that today is that young man's 10th year feast, so they should let him personally entertain their distinguished guests. He looked at Long who was positioning himself to attack. Then they both jumped up and attacked each other. He smilingly looked at Long, who was smiling back at him. Then they attacked each other continuously and speedily like they were just playing around. Xingyun was shocked to see that they were so fast that he couldn't even keep up with their movements. This made him realize that no wonder he couldn't touch Xiaoyao before. Fu told Xingyun not to blink and to stay focused because the real competitors at the pinnacle of that era were not prodigies like him. But those monsters, and such monsters, were right in front of him now. So he shouldn't miss that opportunity to witness their might. Long activates his dragon fist, and Xiaoyao activates his monarch seal skill. Then, they both release it at the same time to attack each other, causing a huge explosion. Luoli covers her face, and when she opens her eyes, she is surprised to see a massive barrier in front of her. Tian, who created the barrier to protect everyone, calls them brats, telling them that they have some power. They wait until the smoke disappears and see the two children inside the barrier facing each other. He tells Long that he seems quite pleased for someone seeking revenge. However, Long asks him why he should bother with the grudges of the previous generation, mentioning that it is rare to have a chance to fight someone who has broken through the Heavenly Dao's shackles. Long grabs his coat and throws them behind him, asking Xiaoyao how one cannot be excited when facing him. Then, Long activates his inner power hidden inside his body and calls upon the ancient sacred body to perform another of his moves. A strong blue light emerges from Long's body, forming a huge dragon above him. Long confidently looks at Xiaoyao, but Xiaoyao calmly tells him that in the face of a fully committed opponent, responding seriously is the only proper etiquette. Xiaoyao activates his power using hand signs and points his fingers like a gun in Long's direction, telling him that he'll show him the ancient sacred body he wants to see so badly. Tian, who sees Xiaoyao's stance, is shocked, knowing what it is. Then he begins to chant, taming the mysterious, flowing endlessly, truly reflecting the heavens, yin and yang uniting as one, nourishing all forms. The mystical profound scripture, the Jun family's supreme secret technique, slowly appears in front of them, using the mystical profound to command the Kai, solidifying it into a blade that transforms into a divine weapon. After he finishes chanting, a swarm of swords appears around him, shocking the onlookers who recognize it as the Jun family's war decree. Someone shouts that rumors say that when that decree is fully mastered, the spiritual Kai can form thousands of divine weapons, capable of splitting the heavens and obliterating the earth. He releases his swords to strike Long, and Long retaliates confidently, telling him to bring it on. Long's dragon flies directly toward him, but his swords hit it continuously, making it shatter into pieces and disappear in front of its master. Long sweats, realizing the prowess of the ancient sacred body. He then uses his war decree together with his dragon slayer power to attack Long. Long gets hit, and as it hits him, he stands still. However, Long eventually kneels on the ground, defeated, and questions if there will come a day when he can reach such a realm. The ground in front of them is destroyed because of Xiaoyao's power, but he simply turns around, raises his fist proudly, and smiles at his grandfather. The people realize that he is worthy of being the divine son of the Jun family, acknowledging him as a true genius. They congratulate the Jun family for gaining another prodigy. Tian proudly smiles back at him, but then Tian's expression changes to panic when he sees Long above Xiaoyao, ready to attack. He looks back confusedly, but then blood splatters everywhere. Before this, Long hears someone telling him to stand up because he can't lose. Then he jumps to attack Xiaoyao while someone tells him that he can never lose to the Jun family. He cuts Xiaoyao's back using his sharp claws. However, Xiaoyao looks back unscathed and sees Long with damaged claws and glaring at him in anger. He immediately turns around and kicks Long in the face hard while asking Long what he is doing. He is surprised to see Long's eyes and mouth drolling while calling him foolish. Then Long activates his breakthrough, releasing a strong power, pushing back Xiaoyao a little. The man asks if the dragon son Long Yuan had forcibly broken through the Divine Sea Realm, but they know that it would make Long's realm very unstable and wouldn't be beneficial for Long's future, making them wonder why Long does it. After Long's breakthrough, he glares at Xiaoyao in his dragon form and jumps toward him to attack, telling him to die. Xiaoyao senses something is wrong, then jumps in the air to avoid Long's attack. He looks and sees spiritual energy threads around Long's body, which means someone is controlling Long. He follows the threads and sees that the controller is in the sky. 
he activates his divine elephant power to create a weapon while calling the coward who hides his head and shows his tail to get out. Then he throws his divine lightning spear to the sky, and it flies directly above them, heading toward the controller. However, it stops and burns, making him unable to believe it. Suddenly, Long jumps to grab him. He calls Long and grabs his hair, telling him to wake up because he is being manipulated like a puppet when he was the dragon's son. Long just glares at him and growls in anger, making him call Long an idiot while tilting his head back forcefully and hitting Long's head hard with it while shouting for Long to wake up. Long is thrown away because of the force, and the system shows him to sign into the site accessed, a banquet for 10 years. Then it asks him if he wants to log in. He realizes that he had almost forgotten there was a system. He quickly clicks yes, and the system shows that he has signed in successfully, congratulating him on receiving the 7-star reward, Supreme Bone. It explains to him that the Supreme Bone is ranked among the top 3 out of 3,000 physical structures and those with the Supreme Bone can transcend realms and use supernatural powers at a higher level. Also, the system shows him that he unlocked the supernatural power of the Supreme Bone and Divine Tribulation, causing a bright and strong light. The people were shocked and asked if it was the Supreme Bone, if he was born to be the Supreme, and shouted that everyone in the Jun family was a terrible monster. Chan, who witnessed it, couldn't believe it either and wondered when he got the Supreme Bone. Then he remembers Linglong explaining to him that the so-called Supreme refers to those who stand at the pinnacle of the ancient immortal world and are called immortal existence. He looks at the Supreme Bone and looks up, seeing a huge dragon above them glaring at him in anger. He notices that it turned out to be the Supreme Dragon of the Dragon Clan and knows that it wants to kill him, but it can't do it itself, so it uses the Dragon Son as a puppet. He raises his hand and shouts that he heard that his father killed and devoured the Supreme Dragon of the Dragon Clan, and today, he, Junzai Oyal, his father's son, will inherit his father's legacy and do the same. Then he activates the Divine Tribulation while telling the dragon that he will destroy it there, calling it a bird that hides its head and exposes its tail. The strong light comes out of the sky and hits the dragon. It shouts that the light burned its scales and shows itself in disbelief that Xiaoyao could actually force him to transform into its true form. The people are shocked to see the supreme dragon from the dragon's ancestral nest and realize that the son of the dragon dared to come to the Jun family and provoke them because there was a supreme dragon behind him. In other words, the Jun family's divine son had grown into the spiritual sea realm, making them wonder if something like this happened tens of thousands of years ago. However, he calmly calls the dragon a coward, telling it that it finally came out. The dragon tells him that his bravery is commendable and suggests ending the matter there. However, he laughingly asks the dragon what he meant by ending it there when he came to provoke the Jun family first, and then use despicable methods against him. He angrily tells the dragon that it was audacious to expect him to back down with a few casual words, making the dragon ask him what he wants. He asks the dragon if it isn't clear enough from what he said that today. He will follow in his father's footsteps and slay the dark dragon there. The dragon furiously asks how dare he and uses its power to attack them. The youngster is down on the ground because of the pressure the dragon made. But he stands strong and looks at the dragon without care. The dragon can't believe that a mere spirit real youngster could withstand his dragon's might. Then a man positions himself, and Wanji releases his thunder power to attack the dragon. Someone grabs Wanji's shoulder to stop him, and Wanji looks at Tian confused. Tian shakes his head to tell Wanji no. Suddenly, the ground shakes uncontrollably, and someone asks since when does a lowly quasi supreme think they can dare act wildly in his Jun family's territory. They are all surprised, knowing who the voice belongs to, and the dragon realizes that it is not good for him. Then a strong light comes out of the Jun family's realm and flies straight into the dragon, making the dragon shout in pain. The dragon's arm is cut off by the strong light, and it drops to the ground. The people can't believe that the supreme dragon's arm was severed so easily. Xiaoyao looks back and is surprised to see someone grabbing Long by the neck while telling the dragon that he could have taken that youngster and left in peace, but he chose to act against the Jun family there. The Juns are shocked to see their 18th ancestor, and the dragon tells the 18th old man to stop and asks if he dares to kill Long. However, the old man tells the dragon that it is not just Long because he is next. Xiaoyao tries to tell his ancestor to wait, but the old man snaps Long's neck and tells him that since he is there, he might as well stay. The dragon furiously calls the old man a madman and asks if he is trying to ignite an immortal war between the Jun family and the dragon's sanctuary while flying toward the old man to attack. The old man raises his fingers and tells the dragon that it is so verbose, and attacks the dragon with it while asking if it thinks an immortal war phases them when the Jun family has reigned supreme in the celestial realm for ages, and they have never cowered before anyone. The dragon got electrocuted and fell down on the ground. 
The witnesses recognize it as the Lu Celestial Sword Technique, the Dragon Slaying Technique. The 18th ancestor calls Tian, surprising him, and orders Tian to roast the black dragon for their guests, to which Tian excitedly replies yes. One of the men asks if they are actually being served the supreme dragon of the dragon sanctuary as roasted meat, and if they are truly expected to partake. The other man replies that if they eat, they offend the dragon sanctuary, and if they don't, it's a slight to the Jun family. Suddenly, the 18th ancestor tells everyone that he presumes everyone present knows that the Jun family has the Ten Great Sequences, each an unparalleled prodigy. Above the Ten Great Sequences, there is one more position, defeating the prince of the dragon sanctuary single-handedly and standing against the quasi-supreme dark dragon. Sacred child Jun Zioyao is undoubtedly the Jun family's new Xeroth sequence, making Wanji clench his teeth in silence. People around think that Xiaoyao possesses the unshackled sacred body, and being in the spirit realm, forces the Quasi Supreme to show himself. The last emperor of the ancient celestial realm was from the Jun family, so the Jun family might produce another emperor. However, Xiaoyao just stares confusedly at the 18th ancestor, making the old man confused, thinking he seems quick to spot an opportunity. Then the old man throws Long, shocking him, and Long lands in front of him. The old man tells him that Long has unrefined dragon essence within him and orders him to extract it and refine it for his benefit. The old man turns around to leave, telling him that once the banquet is over, he should come to see him. He keeps quiet, looking at the dead body of Long. Later, a few pieces of the dragon's meat were cooked. Shengi asks Luali if she wants to taste dragon meat, but Luali replies no, mentioning that it tastes bad. Fu tells Xingyun to eat the meat of the dragon and explains to him that the flesh and blood of the Supreme Dragon Clan are beneficial and harmless to him. On the side, Wanji tells Tian that he has a question. Tian asks if he is wondering if Xiaoyao participated in the sequence competition. But Wanji replies no. He squeezes his arm in frustration, and Tian tells him that Xiaoyao's sequence number is zero, personally assigned by the 18th ancestor upon his birth. He knows it may not be fair to Wanji, which is why he can launch a sequence battle against Xiaoyao at any time and win because it is the only thing that the 18th ancestor will not interfere with. Wanji thinks for a while and apologizes to Tian for being rude, then says he has more important things to do and takes his leave. Tian thinks that although Wanji is grouchy and cruel, he is not an idiot. If Wanji started a fight with Xiaoyao now, the Jun family would feel embarrassed, and it would be a huge loss. Then Tian asks someone about Xiaoyao, and the man replies that Xiaoyao has gone to refine the dragon's essence. Depending on the situation, Xiaoyao might break through and build the Divine Bridge. Tian thinks from the true spirit realm to the Divine Bridge realm is a big leap and shouts that they have to find Xiaoyao fast. Meanwhile, somewhere in the realm, Sai Oyao and Linglong are together. She tells him that it is Long Heashin's corpse, and he gives her a box, ordering her to burn Long. Then he goes to help find a place to bury Long. She tells him that he seems a little frustrated, but he just asks her if he should be happy in her opinion. He tells her that he is a rising star who defeated his opponent and can overcome the aura of someone seven or eight levels above his level. He should be happy that he gained face for his family, but in that world, life is really cheap. She tells him that in a world full of conflicts, the weak eat the strong and respect the strong. Also, since Long dared to go to the Jun family and cause trouble, he was willing to lose his life, so he shouldn't care. He tells her that the weak eat the strong and asks what the difference is between man and beast, which makes her silent and smile. She tells him that his thoughts certainly don't resemble anyone in that world. If he is not satisfied with the laws of that world, then he can only become the supreme, the highest in existence, and the only great emperor in heaven and earth. Only that way, he will have the power to change the rules. He laughingly tells her that she was right, and whether it was rebirth or the system. He now has it all, and there is a reason behind everything. Then he reached the moon while calling upon the heavens, the earth, and the three thousand worlds to swear that he will become the emperor, and he would do whatever he wanted. Linglong was surprised to see saying it, and then the scenery in front of them slowly changed, and she saw him as a man. She was stunned and shocked to see him grow up, and she saw the people bowing and calling Xiaoyao the heavenly emperor Jun. Then she felt his eye hurt, so she immediately covered it while wondering what it was and what her innate heart glimpsed. He asked her what was wrong and told her that her face suddenly turned pale, but she just replied that it was okay. He jumped off the balcony and told her that after he absorbs that dragon essence he was holding, he should be able to break through. Also, every time the ancient sacred body broke through a great realm, it would need to pass through tribulation, so if she didn't leave, she would be affected by the heavenly tribulation as well. Then he reminded her to prepare new clothes for him, to which she replied yes. Then he jumped off the realm and safely landed on the ground. The moonlight brightened, and he decided to begin. Then they all saw a strong thunder appearing in the sky, 
and Tian panicked, wondering if it was a heavenly tribulation. Then he began to absorb the dragon's essence, causing a strong light to hit him while Tian panicked and couldn't believe that it had already started. Before the strong thunderlight hit him, he grabbed a storage and threw it. Then he ordered it to rise, and it became bigger and bigger, catching the thunderlight coming his way. He tried with all his might to hold on, coughing blood while thinking that the Divine Elephant Refining Purgatory technique has four transformations. The most powerful attack that pierces all things is the Spear of the Abyss. The strongest defense that shields against all things is the Guardian of the Abyss. The Supreme Body technique as fast as the wind is the wings of the Asura. The one that refines all things in the world is the Hellforge. Then he called the 100,000 Thunder Tribulations to forge his immortal sacred body, to which the Thunders did, causing a bright explosion that everyone could see. The man noticed that it is the golden spiritual energy and asked if Xiaoyao of the sacred Jun family was undergoing the tribulation for the primordial sacred body. Afterward, the bright light entered his body and he successfully consumed the dragon essence, which changed his body into a strong build, taller, and his hair became longer. He looked up and asked the being above him if it isn't about time it dispersed. Then the clouds made a space to show the bright light, and a shining monster appeared in front of them, making everyone stunned in surprise. The people couldn't believe that he actually shattered the tribulation clouds and asked which celestial being would dread falling. Then someone said that a significant shift is about to occur in that world, and the Jun family's divine child will likely take the center stage. He knows that when he gathers the spiritual sea in the Danchen, constructs a divine place in the mind, and transforms the flesh into the true spirit, a divine bridge can be built within the body, connecting the Danchen and spiritual sea with the divine palace in the mind. He knows that the divine bridge inside his body is almost complete, and most of the tribulation's power and dragon essence are absorbed by that supreme skeleton so he thinks he'll need to find some heavenly treasure to nourish that supreme skeleton further. Linglong called him while holding his clothes, and he told her that she had come at the right time. Then he wore his clothes, telling her that after the banquets, he planned to leave the celestial emperor's palace and travel around, so she should help him find out which places are worth visiting. To which she replied yes. Then he began to walk, knowing that it is time to meet his ancestor. Meanwhile, in Hongju, the ancestral dragon sanctuary, the citizens inside are down on the ground, in their heads, and worriedly ask what could have happened to make their supreme of the ancestral dragon's sanctuary so furious. Someone tells the ancestral dragon to calm down his anger and asks him what use there is in getting angry like this, and if he intends to storm the Jun family. The old man furiously tells them that Jun's 18th ancestor dared to kill dragon descendants of their ancestral dragon's sanctuary and even slayed the dark dragon with his sword. Then the old man furiously asks them if the June 18th ancestor thinks their ancestral dragon's sanctuary is a roadside stray dog that anyone can trash. A mysterious man tells the old man that Jun's 18th ancestor is known for being a madman in the Jun family, and it is difficult to seek revenge against him. Then the other man asks if they should eliminate the Jun family's sequence since Jun's 18th ancestor dared to kill a dragon descendant of their ancestral dragon's nest. He tells them that he reckons it's time for that ancient sacred body because they had been pampering to enter the world. Someone in the meeting asks if they should inform Aoshin about that matter, but a man replies that there is no need for it because Aoshin is in seclusion, refining his fifth dragon essence. Once Aoshin refines all seven dragon essences, combined with the blood of the god dragon, Aoshin will be capable of dominating the younger generation of the immortal domain. By then, even the Jun family's divine child can be easily slain. The old man furiously agrees, telling everyone that the Jun family must pay for their blood debt. Meanwhile, at the carriage in the sky, Fu asks Xingyun how he feels. Xingyun replies that the Jun family's divine child possesses two extraordinary constitutions, the primordial sacred body and the supreme bone. Also, Xiaoyao's cultivation is far superior to his, yet Xiaoyao doesn't act arrogantly and even treats him with respect, making him realize that he is truly a loser. Fu wonders if Xingyun's Dao heart has been shaken, but then Xingyun tells him that he has no intention of giving up. He may not have the qualifications to be a stumbling block on Xiaoyao's path to becoming an emperor, but there are some things he must strive for on his own. Fu smiles and tells him that it is good that he thinks that way. The next morning, in the Jun family's ancestral grounds, he respectfully bowed to his ancestral master and asked the June 18th ancestral if he had called him. The old man told him that it was very well because he had an imposing presence, truly befitting an emperor, and that he had a question for him. Then the old man asked him what he would do if, in the future, he were to become the emperor. He replied that if he were to become the emperor in the future, he would undoubtedly reign over an era and suppress all enemies in the world defeating every foe of the age. However, if that was all, it would be too boring because every emperor from ancient times to the present has been able to achieve it. The old man stared at him in silence, and he continued by saying that if he became the emperor, he would create an era that would shake the past and astonish the present. 
it would be a new era beyond everyone's imagination, thinking of it as an era with smartphones, internet connections, and steel coursing through the land, where even ordinary people could touch the stars. The old man told him that it was interesting. Then, the old man jumped toward him and asked him if he would like to learn the Immortal Slayer sword technique, but he just asked the old man back if it was the sword technique he used to slay the Supreme Shadow Dragon with a single stroke. The old man laughingly told him that the sword is the sovereign of a hundred weapons, and the sword techniques in the immortal domain are as numerous as the vast sea. Also, among the peak techniques, they are collectively known as the five great divine techniques, and the immortal slayer sword technique of his Jun family is one of those five great divine techniques. He was surprised that it was one of the five great divine techniques, and the old man told him that unfortunately, the might of the immortal slayer sword technique is as formidable as its difficulty. Hence, its supreme art is not open to ordinary clan members to avoid them squandering decades of their lives without reaching the threshold. Then the old man told him that now that he was about to venture out into the world, he bestows upon him that trump card, making him thank his ancestors. The old man explained to him that the Immortal Slayer Sword technique consists of only three forms. The first form is Zion Yun or Immortal Falling, which is a sort of physicality targeting the corporeal body. The second form is Zion Mai or Immortal Annihilation, which is a sword of the soul targeting the divine palace and the spirit. The final form is Lu Zion or Slaying Immortals, which is a sword of the union of spirit and flesh, the very one he used to slay the Supreme Shadow Dragon. Then the old man told him that once he has learned the first form, he can officially venture out into the world. But from then on, he must solve his own problems because he cannot always rely on an old man supporting him from behind, to which he replied that he understands. Three months later, in the Heavenly Emperor's Palace Warehouse, a man asked his friend if he had completed the inventory and classification of the gifts for the Divine Child's 10th birthday celebration. The man replied yes and told his friend that it was no wonder that Linglong had a sharp mind, and without her, they might have spent half a year on that task. The man agreed and told his friend that Linglong, rather than being the Divine Child's maidservant, was more like being the steward. On the other hand, Linglong looked at the message for her and read that her friend had a request from her. Then, her friend tells her that her father is seriously ill and unable to attend the Divine Child's 10th birthday celebration. As a member of the Jun family, she earnestly requests the gift of an elixir of immortality to save their nation's ruler and the countless citizens. She also told her that the Vermilion Bird Ancient Kingdom is willing to offer a position as Prime Minister in return. Linglong realized that the scroll wasn't addressed to Xiaoyao but to her. Suddenly, the ground shook uncontrollably, making her surprised. She immediately looked outside and saw a strong power in the direction of the Jun family's ancestral grounds. Then, she looked closely at the strong bright light and wondered if it was Xiaoyao. The others saw the strong light in the sky too, and Tian was shocked, knowing that it was the sword art of slaughtering immortals, making him ask if it was the 18th ancestor's work. The other old man replied no and told Tian that though the sword energy was formidable, it hadn't reached the level of the 18th ancestors, so it was definitely Xiaoyao. Then the other old man couldn't believe that only three months had passed, yet Xiaoyao had already learned the sword art of slaughtering immortals, making the old man ask what kind of monster Xiaoyao is. Meanwhile, in the ancestral land of the Jun family, the 18th ancestral proudly told him that he was his boy, and he asked the old man if his execution of the immortals' descent style was acceptable. The old man laughingly told him that he remembered that it took him a whole year to comprehend that immortals' descent style, making him awkwardly smile. Then the old man slapped his back and told him that it was time for him to create his era. Later, he raised his hands in the air and smiled, thinking that he could finally leave home and venture into the world, wondering if Linglong had found a suitable place for him. Then he remembered that he needed to bid farewell to his grandfather, but Tian appeared next to him and asked him if he was looking for him. He asked his grandfather how come he was as elusive as Linglong, and Tian told him that it was nonsense. Then, he asked him how he could not come and check on him with all the commotion he caused at the ancestral land and if he had learned the sword art of slaughtering immortals. He proudly replied that he barely learned it and he just learned the first move. Tian told him that he was quite a little prodigy, growing up under his nose, and he didn't even notice the hidden genius in him. He replied that he found out about it himself quite recently, and it goes to show that his eldest grandson is a hidden treasure, one who becomes stronger when faced faced with challenges. Tian seriously told him that he didn't come there to listen to his banter and that he was there to remind him that he possesses two top-tier constitutions, which means he needs to invest double the effort in cultivation, especially the ancient holy body worship that manifested when he was born, and it also contains five unawakened phenomena. Then Tian explained to him that those five phenomena will require his own comprehension to activate but he knows a place where he can accelerate the understanding of the second holy body phenomenon, which makes him surprised. 
Then he sweetly tells Tian to tell him, making Tian wonder why that scene feels so familiar. Tian pushed him back while telling him to stop nauseating him there and asked if he had heard of the Panwu Divine Dynasty. He asked Tian back if isn't the Panwu Divine Dynasty one of the top immortal dynasties, and Tian replied yes. Then, he explained to him that the founder of the Panwu Divine Dynasty was the Panwu Emperor, but it was not important because his Jun family also produced the abandoned Heaven Emperor, and the crucial point is the rumor that the Panwu Emperor possessed an ancient holy body. Tian also tells him that there are legends that deep within the Panwu Divine Dynasty's imperial palace, there is a Panwu shrine, possibly related to the Panwu Emperor. He asked Tian if the Panwu Divine Dynasty would ease easily allow outsiders into their secret place. Chan excitedly replied that nothing is absolute, and he was just letting him know that there is that option. So if it's really not possible, he can forcefully enter for the sake of his future, making him realize that the Jun family's domineering style is indeed passed down through the generations. Then he tells Tian that he'll keep it in mind, and he'll find an opportunity to visit the Panwu Shrine. Suddenly, the system pops up, congratulating him on his new sign and location. He walks around, thinking that currently there are two activated sign in points, the Supreme Yuan Sect's hidden treasure and the Panwu Shrine, and he knows that both of those places aren't places they can just go to on a whim. Then he noticed someone in Sa Linglong sitting. He happily asked her if she was not waiting for him, and she replied that she was his attendant, and she should be waiting there. He shakes and tells her that she makes him feel anxious when she does that, so if she has something to say, she should just say it. She becomes silent for a moment and hands over the letter to him. Then she bowed in front of him while telling him that she did have a request. He asked her if he hadn't mentioned that he didn't like her all kneeling like it. Then he grabs the message and reads it in front of her. Then he tells her that he does have no shortage of that stuff, so giving her one wouldn't hurt. Then the system once again pops up to congratulate him for his new sign and location and asks him to sign in at the Vermilion Bird Ancient Kingdom's palace. Meanwhile, in Fire Prefecture, the ancient Vermilion Bird Kingdom, at the Imperial City, the man in bed coughed continuously in pain. The ancient Vermilion Bird Kingdom monarch told the lady named you are not to force the elixir of immortality on him and not to make herself suffer any further for it. However, she told her father to rest assured because there is already progress, and the ancient Vermilion Bird Kingdom princess, Bai Yu swore to her father that she would definitely cure him. The maid informed the monarch that the crown prince of the Azure Dragon Kingdom was waiting in the side hall. But the monarch, coughing in pain, shouted that the crown prince is a scoundrel and ordered his people to kick him out. Yur begged her father not to get angry and assured him that she would handle it. Then, Yur walked out of the room to meet the crown prince. She bowed to apologize for her remiss in her greetings and told him that it had been many days since they last met. The crown prince asked her why they needed to be so distant between them, and the Azure Dragon Kingdom crown prince, Zio Chen, told her that it was just a few days apart, but she looked much haggard. She appreciated his concern, and he assured her that on the day of their grand wedding, the Azure Dragon Kingdom would present the Elixir of Immortality as a betrothal gift. She smiled and expressed her gratitude, hoping that Chen is truly as generous as he says. A moment later, she walked away with her maid, cussing and shouting that their monarch clearly got poisoned during his exploration of the secret realm with the Azure Dragon Monarch, and they were using that as leverage to demand a marriage alliance from her. The maid furiously asked where Chen gets the nerve to feign deep affection in front of her. Yu called her maid Aju to order her to keep quiet, reminding her that even the walls have ears, let alone in that open space. Aju told her that she just can't help but feel sorry for her. Yu sighed and continued walking, thinking that if they really form an alliance with the Azure Dragon Kingdom, the Vermilion Bird Kingdom will be completely at a disadvantage, and their ancestral legacy will eventually be swallowed up by the Azure Dragon Kingdom, making her wonder if there's no other way. Suddenly, a man shoutingly called her, telling her that it was urgent news. The man panted in exhaustion and reported to her that a letter from the Jun family had arrived, making her stunned in surprise. Then she ordered the man to quickly bring it to her, to which the man complied. She opened it and excitedly shouted that it was a reply from Linglong and that her father could be saved. Meanwhile, in the Jun family, a palace of the Heavenly Emperor, he was looking and picking at something. He thought that he should choose the one he picked earlier while Hua Granny, the guardian of the Jun Linglong lineage, asked Linglong what Xiaoya was doing. Linglong replied that Xiaoya was probably selecting a mount for his journey to the Fire Prefecture. Hua Granny told her that as a deity, Xiaoya should be riding the Nine Dragon Carriage and asked her why Xiaoya was choosing among those exotic beasts. She replied that Xiaoya didn't want to draw too much attention, not because he was afraid of causing trouble. But when Yuer talked about repaying with national allegiance, she meant she'd submit to him and become his personal vassal, to which Linglong replied yes. Then she explained to Hua Granny that behind every Jun family member's ranking, they have their own vassal forces, and even the 10th-ranked Jun Jan Jian has the ancient sword secret obedient to him. 
So, although the vermilion bird kingdom's power has waned in recent years, a starving camel is still bigger than a horse, and the princess carries the vermilion bird divine fire, making her a prodigy in the younger generation. He teasingly asked Linglong if she is not just interceding for the sisters, making her stunned in disbelief for a second. Then she acted while telling him that she would never because she is devoted to him and asked him how could she deceive him for the elixir of immortality for the sake of outsiders. He told her not to act anymore and explained that it was just a joke. Then he seriously told her that he also doesn't want to accept every tongue. Dick, and Harry under his wing, so whether the Vermilion Bird Kingdom deserves that elixir of immortality, he wants to see for himself. She realized that Xiaoyao's actions are always different from ordinary people, so she thinks the future she glimpsed that day is true. But then Xiaoyao excitedly called her and showed her the lamb while telling her that they should ride it to the fire prefecture because it was a first-class divine beast. The lamb spits out, making her stunned in disbelief, and she tells him that she refuses. A moment later, she tells him that there is one more thing that requires his decision before setting out, and asks if he has time. He asks her what is up while excitedly riding the lamb. She replied that it was Lan Kinga and reported to him that she temporarily confined Kinga in the dungeon, and the clan elder instructed that he handle that matter. He tells her that it is the noisy little girl and asks her what she thinks he should do with Kinga. She replies that if he colludes with foreigners and brings harm to his family, he will be punished according to the clan rules. He asks her if it was crucifixion, and she replies that he is correct. Then, she explains to him that crucifixion involves securing the limbs of the guilty to wooden stakes and exposing them to sunlight until they wither. He thinks that the method of torture, whether by rotation or other means, varies among different cultures. Then he orders Linglong to get a pen and paper, making her confused, and she thinks it is for serious business because he calls her by her name normally. He asks why worry about the emperor not coming out if they have him in their family and tells her that it was a quote from the future emperor. He tells her to write that in the future, it must be assigned for every school age child to memorize the entire text, and they should remember that for troublemakers like Lan Kingya who jump into foolish actions right away. Article 1 of the quotes of the Emperor Junshin, to kill without teaching is considered cruel, making her surprised. Meanwhile, in Jun's dungeon, Kingya was inside the cell, and someone appeared in front of her, making her say that she finally arrived. Kingya tells Linglong that she has only one request, and it is to give her a good break. She tells Kingya that she was just there to convey Xiaoyao's punishment to her. Then she tells Kingya that she colluded with foreigners to bring calamity to the royal family. So Xiaoyao punishes her to kneel outside the Heavenly Emperor's palace for a year, reflecting on her actions. During that year, she must not leave, regardless of what she encounters. After one year, when grievances are settled, she will be expelled from the Jun family, and they will not trouble her again. But if she still harbors resentment towards Xiaoyao, she may choose to cultivate and challenge him on her own terms because he will not refute challenges from anyone. If she persists in not repenting and continues colluding with foreigners against the royal family, then Xiaoyao will crush any forces she colludes with and then personally kill her. On the other hand, Zhuang Jian asked Zhu Wang if Xiaoyao had any specific grievances against him in that matter, and Zhu Wang replied that Xiaoyao probably hadn't even paid attention to the past when he offended him. Then Zhuang Jian asked why he bothers dwelling on it, making Zhuang Jian silent. On the other hand, Tian tells the elder that Xiaoyao is indeed too soft-hearted. But the elder replies that rather than saying Xiaoyao is soft-hearted, it's more accurate to say that in that era of dominance, Xiaoyao seeks the benevolent path that commands the allegiance of the people. Chan agreed that the righteous path is indeed more challenging than the tyrannical one and asked how many can truly gain the allegiance of all the people in that world. The next day, Juke Ancient Kingdom, Royal Palace. Yuer excitedly called Linglong, and Linglong smilingly met Yuer. Yuer tells her that in the end, she still relies on sister men are utterly unreliable. But Linglong just tells Yuer not to lift her up and that there is the Kirin elixir, but it is not in her hand. Yuer asked her what the meaning of it is, and she replied that her lord said he wanted to see with his own eyes whether that country was worth him bringing the elixir, so he didn't come with her. Yuer couldn't believe that there was someone she called her lord and asked her what kind of extraordinary individual could willingly captivate someone as proud as her, but she just awkwardly replied that she'd know it once she saw it. Meanwhile, in the imperial city, a certain restaurant. Someone poured him tea, and he said that it was good tea, but he thinks it would be even better without those noisy guys while he was looking at the man lifting the waiter by the neck, asking the waiter if he was deaf. He reminded him that he asked for the best food and drinks there, yet he was trying to satisfy them with that kind of stuff. Then the man asked the struggling waiter if he didn't know who they were. The man informs the waiter that due to him, the mood of their companions has worsened. However, the waiter can't respond and gradually runs out of breath. Fortunately, one of the man's companions grabs his arm. 
The man then asks the Suzaku envoy if he wants to join in spoiling the fun of the brothers. The Suzaku man replies that he just feels the Azure Dragon envoy shouldn't get angry over such trivial matters. Since the food at that restaurant didn't meet his taste, they should look for an even better one. The man releases the waiter and informs him that, for the sake of the face given by the Suzaku envoy, he'll spare him this time. The man turns around to leave, shouting that the food tasted so bad in that restaurant that it's better to shut it down. Meanwhile, Zaiwaiyao is busy eating his fried chicken, thinking that even a wild boar wouldn't appreciate the subtlety of that brand, and is surprisingly ignorant of savoring such exquisite flavors. He believes the man should take a bigu pill. The Suzaku man asks the waiter if he's okay, and the waiter replies that he is fine. The man gives the waiter some gold coins and advises him to be patient, assuring that it will pass. The waiter respectfully bows to the man, swearing that they will endure, silently observing the scene in front of him. Later, the waiter arrives with his food and informs him that his additional large portion of grilled lamb chops has arrived. He asks the waiter about the identity of those people earlier and whether their ruler doesn't care about someone acting arrogantly in the imperial capital. The waiter explains that he might be unaware, but in the past few years, their ruler explored the secret realm with the ruler of the Kinglong Kingdom. Unfortunately, they were injured by the ancient demonic beast, the Nine Venomous Serpent Demon. Since then, suffering from severe poison, their ruler has been bedridden, and only the Killin's life-saving elixir can cure that ailment. Coincidentally, the ruler of the Kinglong Kingdom possesses a plant of the Immortality Herb, and promised to gift his medicine to their country, on the condition that their princess marries into their kingdom. The waiter also mentions that the people from earlier are under the command of the crown prince of the ancient Kinglong Kingdom. He perceives the situation as desperate and informs the man that for a cultivator, the Killin Immortality Elixir is a rare and precious treasure, even with little stock in the supreme orthodoxy or the immortal power. He then questions the waiter about whether the lord of the Kinglong Kingdom is genuinely willing to give it up. The waiter replies that no one knows, and the Kinglong envoys have been bullying men and women every day since they arrived in the imperial capital. However, as long as they remember that even the princess endures hardships, they'll find a way to endure as well. He observes the waiter's great respect for the princess, and the waiter explains that the princess bears the vermilion bird's divine fire. He thinks among the 3,000 physiques, the vermilion bird divine fire doesn't seem to stand out, and the waiter tells him that it seems he is a traveler from a distant land visiting the vermilion bird ancient nation. The waiter introduces themselves as the people of the sacred vermilion bird and explains that the vermilion bird, born in fierce flames, perishes in soaring flames. As long as the divine fire stays, the vermilion bird stays strong. Therefore, their princess is a symbol of faith for them, the Vermilion Bird's people, to which he replies that he understands. Later, in the Vermilion Bird ancient country princess's sleeping palace, he walks toward it, and the guard sees him coming. The guard shouts at him to stop, asking who he is and how he appeared in their princess's sleeping palace. He just smiles at them and walks past them quickly. The guards immediately look back in panic, and one of them shouts to his companion to come quickly because there is an assassin. The guards run toward him, surrounding him and ordering him to state his name. He calmly replies that he is from Huangju Jun's family, Jun Ziaoyao. The guard is surprised to hear that he is from the Jun family, but one of the guards shouts at him that even if he is a noble guest of the Jun family, he cannot intrude into the sleeping palace of their princess. He thinks the guard is quite brave. Suddenly, Yura shouts at the guards, calling them a bunch of idiots and ordering them to stop immediately. She thinks it is over and remembers that she sensed the aura and rushed over immediately but still couldn't make it in time. Yura also recalls Linglong telling her in advance that although her young master Ziaoyao is young, his temperament is peculiar. Many times, she can't even understand what he is thinking, so she shouldn't have any wishful thinking because Ziaoyao won't think highly of her just because she is her friend. Also, she shouldn't expect her to plead for her because if she speaks up, it will only increase his dislike for her. If she wants to obtain the elixir of immortality from Ziaoyao's hand, she'll have to strive for it on her own. Yura thinks she messed it up and wonders what she can do to salvage the current situation. She positions her hands and tells him that she was unaware of the distinguished guest's arrival, apologizing for not welcoming him from afar. She also mentions that the actions of her subordinates colliding with the esteemed guest reflected her inadequate supervision of them, asking for forgiveness. He looks at Yura from afar, wondering if she is Linglong's good friend and if she is trying to take responsibility upon herself. He tells her that he presumes she is the princess of the Vermilion Bird Ancient Kingdom, so she should know why he has come. However, she didn't inform her subordinate in advance, which makes him think that his arrival is not welcome. 
he turns around to walk away while apologizing for his abruptness and telling her that he'll take his leave now. Suddenly, Yura kneels on the ground, bowing her head in the ground while begging him to stay and telling him to allow her to accept the punishment if she offended him. Then she raises her bleeding head and tells him that she only asks for a chance. He looks back and uses his power to lift her up, telling her that it's unseemly for a nation's royal women to kneel before a foreigner. Yura can't believe that he could make an object fly from a long distance. He snaps his fingers, and Linglong quickly arrives next to him while he's busy telling Yura that he'll give her a chance. Linglong promptly grabs him a chair, table, and tea. Then he sits on the chair and asks Yura how she would convince him to stay. She looks at him worriedly and tells him that the province of Hyuju spans 3,000 miles with vast land and abundant resources, extending far and wide, all part of the ancient territory of the Vermilion Bird. If he is willing to grant a life-saving elixir, just one plant could save the life of the nation's lord and the billions of people within those territories, including royal family members. All can be driven by him, before the saddle or behind the horse, willing to die a thousand deaths without hesitation. He sighed and told her that she seemed to have made a mistake. He corrected her by mentioning that the land where the main family is stationed in Huangzhu is more than a hundred times larger than Huizhu. Furthermore, the surrounding areas of Huangzhu, Daezhu, are also under the control of the Jun family. Then he asked her why he would need her little Huizhu to be under his command. Yura squeezed her arm using her hand and told him that she was willing to serve him, to be a servant for a lifetime, only hoping for his favor and the gift of medicine. The guards shouted at her that she must not do it, but he just laughed and pointed to Linglong, asking Yur if she had seen that girl. He told her that it is Jun Linglong, who has been in the world for 23 years, an expert in serving teas, pouring water, washing clothes, folding quilts, adept at murder, arson, plotting for wealth, and taking lives in every way. He also told Yura that Linglong is his maid and asked her if she thinks she can replace Linglong, to which Yura replied that it must be impossible. He shouted in reply that it was right, and young girls shouldn't think that they could get benefits just by selling their bodies. Then he calmly told Yura that he'll give her some clear directions because he is not some devil, and it seems that the citizens of that country greatly respect her. However, he is not sure if she deserves their respect. He also told her that it is said that the people are the foundation of the nation, and the stability of the foundation ensures the peace of the nation. If her vermilion royal family cannot even protect its own citizens, it would be considered worthless. Then he asked her why he should waste the valuable elixir of immortality on her. He stood up to walk away while telling Yura that he would leave that country in three days. Before that time, if she still could not change his mind, it would only mean that the ruler of the Vermilion Kingdom and the elixir of immortality in his hands are destined to part ways, leaving Yura silent while looking at him walking away. On the other hand, he was walking with Linglong, but he was sweating when he peeked at her and saw her furiously glaring at him. He asked her if she was blaming him for embarrassing her little sister, but she replied no and told him that she didn't kill anyone or set fire to anything. She hasn't schemed for wealth at the cost of lives either, making him sweat more and apologize to her. And meanwhile, inside the kingdom, Yura tells her father that she wants to do something, but she doesn't know if it's the right thing. Acting recklessly might bring the ancient nation of the Vermilion Bird Country to the brink of destruction. The monarch reassures her that if she truly wants to do it, she should go ahead because he trusts her. As long as the divine flame endures, the Vermilion Bird shall not perish. The next day, he was on the balcony playing an instrument when Linglong asked him if he could also play the piano. He replied that he couldn't, mentioning that he understood some basic musical notation but was not proficient. Then the system pops up in front of him, congratulating him for receiving the four-star award. The ancient holy soldier of the Tang Dynasty, Fengaming Kishin, for successfully signing to the Vermilion Bird Ancient Palace. He tells her it's okay, he'll figure it out, but if she has time, she should teach him. She asks him why he's suddenly interested in playing the piano, and he replies that it's for using cheat codes to breeze through a game. Not only does he want to learn the piano, but he also wants to learn to dance. If he has the chance, he'd also like to become a carpenter or a blacksmith. Then, he'll figure out a way to create a computer and develop electronic games, making Linglong think that he's saying strange things she can't understand again. He asks her what her good friend would do to try and change his mind. She replies that she doesn't know, but Yura's personality is far more flamboyant than what she currently displays. Suddenly, someone tells them that indeed, Yura is quite flamboyant, and they are surprised to see that it is Granny Hua. Granny Hua tells Linglong that just now, her friend Yura took a confederation letter and went to see the eldest prince of the Azure Dragon Ancient Kingdom. He excitedly asks what kind of broken engagement plot it was and tells them that they should go and watch the show. Meanwhile, in the other guest house, Chen asks Yura what she means by it telling her that her joke isn't funny at all. 
she replies that in simple terms, the Vermilion Bird Ancient Nation is officially ending its marriage alliance with the Azure Dragon Ancient Nation from today onwards. She is aware that the Vermilion Bird Ancient Nation has been busy with state affairs lately, so she requested him to return immediately. She also tells Chen that in the future, she will personally visit the Azure Dragon Ancient Nation to apologize. Chen furiously asks her if she is humiliating him, but she firmly replies that it is he who is humiliating her, insulting the entire Vermilion Bird Ancient Nation. Then she reminds him that they claim the elixir of immortality as the betrothal gift for the marriage alliance, yet the wedding is set three years later, which his father can't hold on, and his subordinates daily humiliate the citizens of the Vermilion Bird in the Imperial City, but he never intervened. Then she angrily squeezes the paper in her hand while asking Chen if he is trying to test her limits. She throws the paper on Chen's face and tells him that it is her bottom line. Chen furiously tells her that having support makes a difference, and he hears that a young man in white recently intruded into his palace, then swaggered out through the main gate, which made him presume that it was her little lover. She just turned into another man's plaything, nothing more, selling herself for the elixir of immortality, and willing to demean, which is indeed not qualified to enter the gates of his Azure Dragon Nation. The both of them are silent for a moment, staring at each other, and Xiaoyao, who is eating invisibly, thinks that Chen's brainstorming ability is a bit strong. Then he wonders how Yuer would respond to it. She tells Chen that she initially thought he was just a bit refined, but now she confirms that he is quite a scoundrel. Now she genuinely feels, from the bottom of her heart, that he is quite pitiful. Chen furiously asks her what she says. She firmly tells Chen that he can only rely on imagination and insults to salvage his pitiful self-esteem, and as a man, he is pitiful and pathetic. Chen furiously swings his hand, telling her to shut up and attacks her with it, calling her a derogatory term. Ewer gets hit in the stomach, pushed back, and slammed into the wall hard. Chen realizes that he couldn't resist it, but Xiaoyao just peacefully eats while watching them, and Ewer is bleeding continuously. <laughs> Chen realized that she neither defended herself nor dodged his attack, making him wonder what she meant by it. She silently moved, while Xiaoyao wondered if that hit shattered all of Ewer's internal organs. However, Xiaoyao was surprised when he saw Ewer releasing flame and standing up as if Chen's attack was nothing. She calmly told Chen that with that blow from him, the debt between their countries was now settled, and he was no longer welcome there. He should leave, making Chen angrier and launching another attack toward her. She calmly released her flame to counterattack, but then someone blocked Chen's attack, causing a loud explosion that surprised them both. Xiaoya was holding Chen's hand while telling Yuer that he liked her response and she had convinced him, making Yuer excitedly thank him. Chen asked him who he was, and he playfully replied that he was a passing lover who happened to be passing by there. Then, teasingly, he asked Chen if he was surprised. Chen furiously called them a couple of derogatory terms and attacked him with an Azure Dragon breaking the Sky Fist, but he simply blocked it with his hands. Then he told Chen that he felt a bit annoyed when he saw the Dragon Clan now and attacked Chen with his Dragon Cutting Hand. Chen was surprised and pushed out of the house, coughing blood in pain. Yuer couldn't believe that Xiaoyao threw Chen away with just one slap and asked Linglong about Xiaoyao's current cultivation level because Chen is considered a prominent genius in the renowned Four Symbols ancient country. But Chen was unexpectedly handled so easily. Linglong replied that Xiaoyao is currently in the God Bridge realm, a later stage. Yuer remembered the cultivation realms, first is the fleshy body realm, second is the divine hidden realm, third is spirit sea realm. Fourth is the Divine Priest Realm, fifth is the True Spirit Realm, and lastly is the God Bridge Realm. She was surprised and asked if Xiaoyao isn't directly surpassing two major realms. Yuer shoutedly asked Linglong how old Xiaoyao is, and Linglong replied that Xiaoyao is only 10 years old but looks quite mature for his age, making Yuer exclaim that the world is truly marvelous. On the other hand, Chen slaps the ground and slowly stood up cursing Xiaoyao in anger. Then Chen throws his coat, shoutingly telling him not to underestimate him. Chen wrapped his hands around his body, releasing a strong thunder. Then Chen released his Divine Palace 4 Divine Palace 6th level, but Xiaoyao just smiled, knowing that it was infused with dragon energy and thought that some good fortune was at play. Chen called him a brat and ordered him to kneel down while showing him the Azure Dragon Heavenly Seal technique, but he teasingly asked Chen if he deserved it. Then he gathered some of his power in his hand and released his true dragon entrapment technique. His dragon easily broke Chen's dragon seal into pieces, descended, and flew straight towards Chen, leaving him stunned in surprise and hits Chen causing a huge explosion. Seconds later, Chen was lying inside the huge hole, wondering what happened and why he fell to the ground. 
Then he remembers the true dragon entrapment in front of him and frustratingly realizes that he completely lost his eye oil. Chen looks at him, staring, and becomes angrier, knowing the meaning of his gaze. He jumps out of the hole to attack, shouting for him not to show mercy. He furrows his brow because of Chen's ignorance and puts his fingers down. A lot of equipment flies around Chen, and he rolls his hand to attack Chen with them. Yuer shouts, begging him to show mercy, making him peek back in surprise. Chen opens his eyes wider in disbelief. Yuer tells him that Chen's death in Vermilion Palace might cause some trouble and asks him if he can throw Chen out and then beat him. Chen furiously calls her a bitch, but he tells Yuer that it was a good idea. He grabs Chen using his telekinesis and lifts Chen up in mid-sky. Chen shakes in pain and can't believe that he has telekinesis. He closes his fist and pulls it backward, making the dragon inside Chen come out forcefully. Then he grabs the dragon aura and teasingly asks Chen if it was the dragon aura he was so proud of. Chen shouts, telling him to give it back to him, but he angrily tells Chen that he is too noisy and squeezes his palm, making Chen get electrocuted because of his thunder. He tells Chen that the Jun family in Huanju is free and easy, so he should remember that name because he can come to seek revenge anytime. Then he throws Chen away, telling him to fuck off. On the other hand, in some parts of the Vermilion Bird Kingdom, people are busy walking around when suddenly, Chen appears out of nowhere and slams on the ground hard. The people look at Chen, first worriedly asking who that man is who got beaten badly. When someone notices that it is the eldest prince of the Kinglong Ancient Kingdom, they laugh while shouting that it serves Chen right and Chen probably got beaten by their princess. On the other hand, Yuer gets flustered, but he tells Yuer not to worry because he didn't kill Chen, he just disabled Chen's meridians. He also tells Yuer that Chen still has some opportunities ahead of him, so Chen will likely rise again sooner or later. Then he looks at Chen's dragon aura in his hand and throws it toward Yuer, making her ask him what it is. He replies that it was the green dragon governing wood, and while she mastered fire, using wood to generate fire, that dragon energy should help her break through to the true spirit realm. She thanks him, but he tells her to hold off on the thanks for now because she should take him to meet her father, making her excitedly smile at him. Then she immediately walks ahead and tells him to come that way. Meanwhile, inside the kingdom, the man checks the pulse of the monarch and sadly tells the old man next to him that it has worsened again. If the Killin's immortality elixir is not found soon, the monarch could be gone. The monarch tells the minister to prepare to draft a decree transferring the throne to his princess, Ewer, making the minister call the monarch in sadness. Suddenly, Ewer calls her father excitedly and tells her father that his illness can be cured. The man helps the monarch sit up and is surprised to see someone with Ewer. He asks Ewer who the person standing behind her is, and she replies that he is the young master Jun Ziyoyao of the Jun family. The monarch is shocked to hear it and remembers that some time ago, someone from the Jun family bravely registered the Supreme Ghost Dragon, that sovereign of the Z off sequence, making him not expect Zioyao to come in person. The monarch tells Yuer to help him up because he can be so disrespectful when a noble guest arrives, but Zioyao tells the monarch that he doesn't have to do it, and they should skip those formalities. Then he summons something in his hand and shows elixirs while telling the monarch that the princess of his esteemed country has passed his test, so he will keep his promise and gift him an immortal elixir. The monarch knows that every emergence of the immortality elixirs stirs up ripples in the vast desolate and immortal realm, making him unable to believe that Zioyao casually produced four elixirs. It makes him wonder if it's the profound heritage of an ancient and venerable family. He tells the monarch that if he accepts that immortality elixir, he must also keep his promise that the Vermilion Bird ancient nation will submit to him and become a vassal state under his personal dominion. The monarch looks at him in silence for a moment, looks down, and calls Yuer, who is at his side, in approval, to which she nods her head. Then the monarch kneels in front of him and respectfully tells him that the Vermilion Bird ancient nation is willing to pledge loyalty to him. Even if they have to go through fire and water, they would not hesitate, to which he replies that it is excellent. On the other hand, Chen was walking while dragging his feet. The people teasingly asked if he wasn't the elder prince of the Azure Dragon Ancient Kingdom and why he was acting like a dog. Then Chen heard someone telling the others that he heard Chen got divorced, thrown out by the Vermilion Bird Princess, and beaten as well. However, the people didn't care because he behaved so arrogantly before. A moment later, Chen arrived at the forest where there were no people around and furiously clenched his teeth in anger. Then Chen punched the tree in front of him and continuously attacked it while repeatedly saying Ziyoyao's name. Chen broke the tree in half and swore that he'll kill Ziyoyao. When the tree fell to the ground, he stopped and asked himself what he was doing like an idiot. Suddenly, someone asked Chen if all descendants of his Kinglong ancient nation lacked ambition like him. Chen looked around and shoutingly asked who it was. Then the pendant on his necklace lit up. It lit up around him, and a strong light came out of it, forming into a human. Chen was surprised to see an old man in front of him. The old man asked him if he had already forgotten him. 
Chen looks at the old man and remembers that the old man was the statue in the center of the Azure Dragon Ancient Kingdom. The old man tells him that he was the founding ancestor of the ancient nation of Kinglong, the venerable Kinglong Sage. Chen respectfully pays his respects to his ancestor. The old man tells him that he awakened several years ago and sensed that he is the current son of destiny for their ancient nation of Kinglong. He has infused a considerable amount of dragon energy into his body, but unexpectedly, he ended up making a wedding gown for someone else. Chen shouts at the old man, telling him that with just half a step, he could enter the realm of the Quasi Supreme, and he asks the old man why didn't he just take action to kill Ziyoyao. The old man replies that he was bewildered, and his current strength was a mere fraction of what it used to be. Then the old man asks him if he knows who Ziyoyao is. In response, Chen asks the old man if Ziyoyao isn't just a descendant of the Huangju Jun family. The old man tells Chen that he has been talented since childhood, yet he is trapped in the limitations of the present, and the news hasn't reached the spiritual consciousness residing in his ring. Then the old man explains to him that Ziyoyao is the divine son of the Jun family, a Xeroth in the lineage. Just recently, the ancestor of the Jun family personally killed a peer, the supreme phantom dragon, who was on par with him. Also, the Jun family has produced madmen for generations. So if he makes a move against Ziyoyao in half a day, the ancient nation of Kinglong will be razed to the ground by the Jun family. Angry, Chen asks the old man if it means he'll never be able to seek revenge and settle that grudge in his lifetime. The old man tells him not to despair because he is the son of destiny for their nation, and he will not allow him to end in such a bleak manner. The old man also tells him that although his meridians are crippled, fortune and misfortune are intertwined for him. He will teach him the Quasi Supreme Cultivation Technique, the Azure Sky Dragon Transformation Technique. Then the old man swears to him that the Azure Sky Dragon Transformation breaking to rebuild and the debt of today's great enmity must be repaid to Ziyoyao a hundred times over. A few months later, Ziyoyao was busy meditating. Then a strong power came out of his stomach, which he held and focused on. Ewer tells Linglong that in just a few months, Ziyoyao reached complete mastery of the Divine Bridge Realm, which is truly astonishing. Ziyoyao's cultivation speed is commendable. Linglong tells Ewer that in terms of Ziyoyao, the speed is considered slow and thinks that she has spent more time practicing the Immortal Killing Sword technique. A moment later, Ziyoyao opened his eyes and asked them what brought the two of them to look for him. Linglong grabs something in her clothes and tells him that the letter sent to the Jun family is the message sent by Zhuangjian. He wonders for a moment who Zhuangjian is, and then he remembers that it is the young lad with thick eyebrows. Then he asks Linglong why his sword clan brother is looking for him and if there's any particular reason to which Linglong replies yes. Then he opened the message and read to him that Zhuangjian called him the respected son of God to tell him that in the southern Yuan Dao province, there are signs of an extraordinary occurrence, with the aura of a supreme being permeating the surroundings. If there is no accident, it seems the secret treasure of the Yuan Heavenly Supreme is about to emerge. So he wishes to inform him of that matter and salutes him with his sword. He asks Linglong why Zhuangjian is quite polite to him, and Linglong replies that it seems that because of Lan Qingye's incident, Zhuangjian felt that he helped him out, so Zhuangjian wants to repay him. He tells Linglong that since it was the kindness of his clan brother, he will accept it and orders her to prepare the carriage, and he will ride the Nine Dragons chariot to the southern Yuan Dao province, to which Linglong agreed. Then he asked Yuer about the condition of the monarch, and Yuer replied that the monarch had consumed the elixir of immortality, and his health was now stable. Also, at present, the monarch is utilizing the potency of the elixir of immortality in seclusion, attempting to break through the holy realm. He realizes that the sickly monarch turned out to be a quasi-sage, and it was true that a person cannot be judged by their appearance. Then he tells Yuer that it seems that this time she won't be able to accompany him. If she handles the state affairs diligently, there will be plenty of opportunities in the future, so she should remember to maintain a humble heart but not lose her resilient spirit. If there is urgency, she should feel free to send a message to him through Linglong. Also, a person of her lord's free-spirited nature should never tolerate humiliation to which she respectfully replies yes. Meanwhile, in the 3000 Dao provinces, the state of Kun, an abandoned place where the territory is barren, bandits are rampant, and monsters plunder the sky. A monster opens its wing and flies in midair freely, while Chen is standing on a high stone, looking at the flying monsters. The eldest prince of the ancient Qinglong kingdom, Xiao Chen, stands strong and punches the air with all his force. He then jumps forward toward the flying monster and attacks it with his Azure Dragon's sky-rending grip. He safely lands on the stone and proudly looks at the killed monster behind him. The old man tells him that it is not bad, and in just a few months, he has mastered the Azure Sky Dragon transformation up to the fourth stage. The old man also tells him that he has advanced his cultivation to the mid-stage of the Divine Bridge Realm. 
Chen expresses his gratitude to the old man for his guidance. Suddenly, they hear a speedily horse running and see men chasing someone. The man calls the Lady Beauty and asks her where she is running. Then the creepy old man tells the lady that within the state of Kun, no one can get rid of the demon wolf bandits. The old man tells Chen that the demon wolf bandits in the state of Kun have gained a bit of notoriety recently, and judging by the aura, the leader's cultivation has already reached the unity realm. Chen tells the old man that at the pinnacle of a divine bridge, spirit, and body meld, attaining a harmonious union, possessing such cultivation, yet that man is willingly descending into decadence in that desolate land. On the other hand, the lady is running away, thinking that the men are hateful, and if only she could utilize her cultivation, she wouldn't have been entangled by those annoying troublemakers. The leader of the bandits shouts to the lady that she'd better come home with him honestly. Suddenly, someone jumps toward the bandits' leader and lands in front of the lady. Chen looks at the bandits, while the lady looks at him in surprise and confusion. He calls the bandits a bunch of petty thieves and orders them to leave. But the bandit's leader asks where that brat came from and how dare he meddle in the affairs of his demon wolf bandits. Chen orders them to roll, but the leader still calls him a brat. Then his fist speedily appears on the bandit's leader's face, and he punches the man hard, making him fall off his horse and slam on the ground hard. The members open their mouths at the same time in surprise and ask him how dare he attack their boss. Then the men run toward them with their horses, shouting at him to go to hell, but he frowningly glares at them and speedily swings his sharp claws at them. The men, one by one, are thrown to the ground, and in just a second, the bandits are defeated. He looks back and asks the lady if she is okay, but the lady just asks him back who he is. Well guys, that's the end of the video. If you like this video, comment part 3 in the comment section. Also subscribe to the channel, hit the bell and like the video. Thank you for watching and see you next time again.